Assalamu alaikum folks, ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban, welcome back to Mind Trap. We have an esteemed guest for you tonight. I'm just going to bring up the profile picture right before you again. A guest who we've had previously uh, on an amazing show in the past, uh, Dr. Shahzad Salim from Pakistan, who who came on previously over a year and a half ago, and we discussed uh, some fantastic topics on the Quran. Today, I'm just going to bring before, sorry, just one second. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, apologies for the, I was just trying to transition the screens, and that's what happens. Welcome, marhaban, salamu alaikum. And shukran for joining us uh, once again, uh, Sheikh Dr. Shahzad Salim. Can you, I take it you can all hear me, you can hear me fine, the volume's coming through. I'm just going to do a quick, uh, whilst I'm just introducing uh, your your efforts in Pakistan, uh, Dr. Saab, I'm just going to do a quick sound check as well. Those of you that, uh, so... On, fa on Facebook and YouTube, if there's any audio issues, just uh, give us a shout. I take it everything is fine. Yep. So, all right. Shukran. Shukran. I see your comments. Ahlan wa sahlan. Uh, people, Dr. Shazad Salim uh, has been doing some amazing work. We do have an, uh, an intro in our previous Mind Trap, working with the Maurid Institute of Allama Jo. Javed Ramdi Saab, who's done some breakthrough kind of research and really uh, just just really true, uh, inspiring and revolutionary, pivotal really for our age. Uh, Dr. Shahzad Salim has worked very closely with Javed Ramdi Saab, uh, continues to inspire many people around the world, uh, especially focusing that with their efforts focused on the Quran, but branching out into many other topics. Um, so, and today's topic, we're going to, I'd love to unpack some amazing stuff for you guys, inshallah. But before we get into some of that, I wanted to just pick up uh, with you, Dr. Saab, on what, how are the, since we last spoke, how are the efforts going in, in Pakistan? That's where you're centrally based in Lahore. Have, has there been much change? I know there's been a lot of turmoil in Pakistan as well. So, um, yeah, take it away. Thank you very much, Mufti Abdullah, for having me once again. Uh, in Pakistan, as far as our own work is concerned, uh, uh, in the COVID era, which is now almost uh, at an end, uh, we have been uh, doing our work online. So education, uh, which is primarily our target, educating young minds, engaging with the youth, and, and uh, conducting various courses. So we have been doing that. Uh, online and alhamdulillah quite successfully uh, but now that uh, all restrictions have almost been lifted uh, so we have these plans as well to have on campus education uh, resumed once again and uh, but one thing which is absolutely certain is that the covid era has given us this opportunity to engage people online much more and not only does uh, the engagement have this wider audience but also the cost and the time is also cut down so I would say that uh, uh, we might still go on uh, in this manner and uh, hopefully, inshallah, uh, uh, give our best and try our best because basically this is a this is a work in progress. Uh, there is no end to it. So educating people as much as we are able to and uh, discussing with them uh, all sorts of questions that come to their mind as well as debating with them and trying to uh, make sense of a lot of things that uh, might bother their minds. So it's basically engagement all the way through education. Okay. What are some of the uh, the kind of things just that you are engaged in in Pakistan when, when you're teaching? I mean, what are, uh, just to give people a bit of an idea that w w what is it that you're, that you're doing on, let's say, you know, on the ground in your, whether it's week to week or month to month? So you see, we have a team of about, I would say, close to 15 people uh, engaged in various uh, teaching and research activities. And uh, there are specialized courses, uh, for example, there are these Sunday school courses in which 
the younger ones they are uh, uh, they are given this opportunity once a week to interact and uh, uh, be taught uh, for in a very concerted way uh, then we have the alim course which which is a, which spans over 7 years uh, in which people are educated to become scholars and then we have specialized courses uh, short courses in which uh, let's say spanning about 3 weeks or 5 weeks or 7 weeks depending upon uh, the need so some of these uh, courses are I'm, almost all of them were conducted online uh, during the covid era but uh, maybe inshallah starting from uh, this summer or the fall of this year uh, many of these courses would be also conducted in person uh, personally i have been teaching the quran the bible the hadith uh as well as i mean the quran the bible and hadith in a way in which uh, we are able to bring it to uh, the younger generation and then there is a technical study of the quran uh, which is for advanced students uh, which i do also once uh, once a week and then we have regular discussions on various social issues which have an impact on religion or vice versa religion might have an impact on those social issues uh, and uh, regular q and a sessions as well Uh, after every such uh, lecture or talk and all of them are pretty much interactive and we would like uh, people to engage as much as they can instead of being a monologue it's more of an interactive discussion uh, and so this is how things have been okay now oh, shukran shukran because it's always good to get a uh, you know a greater picture you know you, you said that you've got the alim course going out of curiosity is does it vary much from the darsa nizami uh, alim course or have have you changed certain oh, topics yes. around or it, it very much is i mean i think it's like an antithesis to that course it's a very different uh, course because uh, contrary to uh, to darsa nizami in which the fiqh of a, of a particular school of thought yeah. holds much more importance uh, uh, in our uh, curriculum the quran is the central point and the quran is taught and so we t- primarily take people who are already well aware of arabic and if they are not aware of arabic language then there is a ground course or a, a basic course through which they are made to go through and so it's like a uh, it's like it's not like a course in which things fall in one place so we have various packages and various courses being floated and yeah. everyone is required to take let's say 50 courses uh to complete the degree and uh, the ones that are being offered are various in various periods of time so all they need to do is complete those 50 or 60 courses over a span of 5 years to 7 years and once that is done uh you will get the degree so it's not that uh, it's like a sequential thing that you have a first year or a second year or a third year it's mm-hmm. like every person can participate depending upon the uh, the uh, prerequisites of a particular course so this is this is how we are designing it and it just started actually last year so this just one year has been completed and this is the second year uh, that would, that will now begin so it's quite it's quite modular it's more about like it's people like can modular, do modules absolutely. where they it's come in it's modular approach right mm-hmm. okay is there out of curiosity is there a uh, a daura hadith kind of parallel or not really uh, have well, we have hadith as a subject i mean like like the quran is a subject we have hadith which means that specialized books of hadith and selection from the hadith they are taught uh not in the form of a dora which is just going through a particular hadith yeah. it's like selecting them and then uh training people to understand the hadith in the light of the quran and also making them uh, equipped with the fact that how they are able to judge a narrative uh through the raya and rawaya principles which have been okay. uh, yeah. charted by our hadith scholars so it's like training them in hadith literature and of course making them go through this hadith literature in a very rich way so that they are widely exposed uh to the content yeah okay wow that's that's amazing does uh, alama ghamdi sahab teach on it himself or uh no he does not I- actually uh, most of the students uh, who have learned from him they are the teachers but uh, it's not that he's directly involved yes the course is uh, made under his guidance the curriculum is very much uh, under his guidance but it's not that he teaches because of a number of reasons of course he has sure. I mean, his, his age as well and he's yeah age as well and i think of course is a, is a is a big commitment so yes mm-hmm. he might give an odd uh, guest lecture or something like that but not a formal sort of a teaching Wow. Okay. Wow. No, uh, that's I, I appreciate you really sharing that with us. It gives uh gives me and many people a greater insight. So, Chair, there's there's a huge 
crisis going on um, around the world, and especially so in South Asia, I feel, amongst Muslims, amongst younger Muslims. And they don't even have to be so terribly young, but maybe people below 40 to, so you could say from 35 to, uh, you know, 18, not even 18, I mean, even teenage, uh, teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, who, I, they, 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 the impression is that they, you know, there's a frustration. They don't, they want to be part of the deen, but they are struggling because they don't want to be a part sometimes of what they feel an image or a certain image, let's say, of the deen is being forced onto them. And and on the same token, they don't want to, many of them don't want to give up Islam. Some of them may even go that way. They end up apostatizing and, and other things. So I felt this because I've, I mean, living here in the UK, I've had increasingly in the last few years, more and more reach from like people just reaching out from places like Pakistan and India. Uh, and I've been quite surprised. So, I mean, th but, but this is uh, from a distance. You're obviously there in the thick of it. Um, yeah, tell us a bit about a bit about this, Sheikh. Well, actually, uh, the crisis that you've just referred to has uh, increased a lot. And you see, uh, there is this uh, radicalization uh, process which has started because of the fact that there is this knowledge explosion uh, taking place and people have uh, access to all kinds of information and on the one hand we might have very young minds like maybe I, I have seen 12 year olds and 13 year olds being getting exposed to radical radicalization and then they just leave their homes uh, i have a couple of uh, uh, cases in front of me and they just left their homes and then went off or jihad or they, they thought that their salvation lies in fighting the disbelievers and they just left their homes and someone they had to be relocated and uh, brought back and then on the other hand we have a whole chunk of people who are exposed to this uh, uh, to what we call as atheism in which uh, religion of course has no importance god has no importance and they think that they can find their way and uh, it is only when they are put to some bother or to some trouble that they might realize that there is some uh, something more to life than what they really think. Otherwise, they have their own uh, path to follow. And then in third world countries like Pakistan and India, Bangladesh, uh, one of the greatest uh, challenges is that uh, youngsters and young minds, they would like to go uh, abroad to study and, uh, and complete their education. So uh, this is another thing in which we have a lot of brain drain and uh, young minds, brilliant minds, they don't end up in the country that they are born. Uh, they generally leave the countries, go, go to the states or the United Kingdom and get themselves educated. On the religious front, the things are even Sorry, more... The uh, audio uh, was slightly... Uh, I would say, uh, the uh, alarming because slightly you see, religious distorted. extremism is is increasing by the day, and the radicalization that is spoke of has been a result of fact. Sorry, it was just slightly. I mean, you, you. I think the connection was slightly wavering. Uh, but uh, but carry carry on carry on. Sorry. Uh, not not the audio. I think it was just the internet connection. But sorry, carry carry on. Is it okay now? Um, it's slightly. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, but it's. I think on because it's saying from here this side. It's reading it as an excellent connection. So. Is it okay? So I think. In this education, uh, as you can clearly yeah. see. Mm -hmm. okay, yep. Car carry on. Carry on. Is this okay now? Uh, yep, inshallah. Let's 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 go with it. If there's any issues, we'll. Okay. Yeah. So in uh, in madrasas and in religious education uh, seminaries, which uh, give this education, uh, the the situation is the same in which we find young minds uh, being admitted into these seminaries, uh, not because of course they have the inclination towards that, because at the age of seven or eight, no one can decide. It is basically the parents who decide uh, their fate. 
and they send them to these uh, seminaries in which uh, religious education is given to them in the same way that uh, I personally would not uh, in any way condone because it's essential that you have the same 12 year ground education, basic education given to all people and then specialization should be the result of that uh, of the pro of the of the final year in which you are able to uh, choose and select uh, for your own self which field uh, you'd like to go but in religious seminaries of course we don't get this chance and what happens is that uh, uh, people uh, they, when they grow up they find themselves being there against their own will mm -hmm. and then they turn against uh, a lot of things and we find them uh, reactionary and frustrated and all things uh, they come into uh, play. So this is uh, uh, something which is not new, it has been there all the while and we have been suggesting it uh, for a number of years that all types of education must be must be you know, begin the same frequency in the same manner such that uh, for the first 12 years of education should be common and mm -hmm. only after that should people go to a religious seminary or a university and that too by choice not yeah. by being pushed into that. I Yeah, I've heard that um, lecture by, I'm sure it's on a number of occasions, but I've watched it by Ramdi Saab, where he's uh, really breaks that down and explains that, look, this is, and it makes sense what he's saying in essence for, for people who haven't come across it is that um, a base education system, a root education system should be just standardized across the state and it should just be for everyone that equips you with certain thinking faculties, critical faculties, writing skills, numeracy, literacy. And when a person reaches a certain amount of, I'm assuming something like equivalent to the UK college or after the Pakistani matrix system, I think. Um, I uh -huh. Th then they could make a decision that do I want to specialize in Islamic studies or not? Right. And, and I think that's a very profound uh, insight, you know, may Allah bless him. And, and one more thing that is important is that uh, in the initial years of education, especially religious instruction, mm -hmm. uh, the, the model aspects and the moral verses of the Quran, they are the ones that should be taught first. So, for example, in grade three or four or five, uh, uh, ethics and morality or verses which relate to ethics and morality, they are the ones that should be brought up first. Yeah. And later as they grow up, uh, the, the, the issues which relate to Sharia and for example uh, to economics and to politics and to the yeah. penal code and to society and to marriage etc. They should be introduced second. So first the, the, the Aqaid part or the Akhlaqiyat part should be uh, I mean introduced and uh, well grounded in their minds and then later on uh, these uh, the fiqh should come, uh, and uh, of course they would be able to understand it later on in in a better in a better way. I remember uh, watching something of Ramdi Saab a few. I think it's been a few years now, and he highlighted some of some of the root issues that need to be um, kind of re embedded. And from there, he, he, he lists them very eloquently. But from what I recall is one understanding that so some are very common sense, like Islam, it teaches us to serve mankind. But we we shouldn't have this understanding that is that we as Muslims, for example, that kuffar are below. They're like a sub insan, you know, like below uh, dehumanize them and Hum Muslims have come to rule the world and uh, we have to establish dominion. And he and he said that some of these, he listed them and he said that some of these common things are so widespread, which they are, um, and they then go on to become a pathology for people. Now, the question would be how, when something like that is so widespread, how do you start? To, because if you start saying... It's like, let's say, you, let's say this simple message that Islam has come to live your life and be an example. Uswatun Hasana. It's not come to rule, you know, Ghalib Maghlub. It's not come for Kuffar. We haven't come to rule. People like a place like Pakistan, where I'm sure that understanding is so common. It's like every person thinks, no, Islam has come to rule the world. Right. Uh, how does a person even start to... Uh, present this this mm -hmm. more uh, sunnah kind of narrative how so again uh, this is a very complex situation because there is a traditional interpretation 
And according yeah. to this traditional interpretation, as you rightly said, that uh, Islam is or should be the dominant force and only Islam has the right to rule and globally it must capture all countries of the world and bring the rest uh, into its subservience. And this has arisen because of an erroneous understanding of certain verses of the Quran. And uh, because of the fact that those verses have a very specific context, uh, th that context is at times uh, ignored and, and, and uh, I just... Uh, Sorry, that's my. That, sorry, just ignore that. That's just a jet. It's flown off okay. uh, an aeroplane. So right. <laughs> I like to joke so that it's my private jet. But okay. <laughs> sorry. So basically, it's this. Uh, I would say an erroneous uh, interpretation, or uh, to to my understanding, something which uh, is not exactly the correct interpretation. Yeah. And there, there needs to be a counter interpretation. In fact, there is a counter interpretation of a lot of these verses. Uh, which uh, which instill this superiority complex in the minds of Muslims in which, in which they think that they are superior uh, to other religions. Not only that, but within the Muslims themselves, for example, the Arabs would think that they are superior to the rest of uh, Muslims. Mm -hmm. And uh, this this uh, inferiority and superiority has its own to toll. So basically, it's uh, it has uh, its roots in uh, interpretation of religion that is now very common in which, for example, you have this target that you have to conquer the rest of the world. You cannot be befriend Christians and Jews. You cannot uh, pay salutations to them. Uh, you cannot pray for their forgiveness. Uh, you cannot inherit from them. Uh, you have you must think that they are condemned to hell. So basically, certain verses of the Quran, which have a very specific context, they have been extrapolated and extended uh, and uh, a general uh, interpretation which exists is that uh, as a result because we are the people who are superior and the rest of them are inferior so therefore we need to uh, we need to do our due now yeah. the important thing is that these verses of course we are not going to abrogate these verses they are present they are there but they have a particular context and that particular context needs to be understood uh, and the context being that in the era of the messengers of God of course which started with prophet Adam and ended upon Prophet Muhammad, there is a specific law of the Almighty which comes into play. And in the post-prophetic era, which of course extends from Prophet Muhammad to the Day of Judgment, it has no role to play. And that law is that the Almighty sets up miniature days of judgment on the face of the earth in the lives of messengers of God. So that people living in the post-prophetic era, they are reminded uh, that yes, a greater day of judgment is going to come and if their own judgment is not taking place in this world at that instance, then they must not forget that one day it shall. And the proof of that is that nations to which messengers were sent in the prophetic era, their fate was decided in this very world. And this is basically a proof of the greater day of judgment. And so therefore, in that prophetic era, there are certain uh, features which are specific to that uh, era. For example, messengers of God will be sent uh, they will deliver the truth, they will be accompanied by miracles and s some other very clear uh, signs from the Almighty to manifest the truth. And once the truth is conclusively con conveyed to them, mm -hmm. uh, they would be punished uh, because of the fact that they had intentionally denied it in spite of being convinced about it. So uh, what we say, as the Quran says, uh, that they denied after recognizing it, after thinking that it was absolutely correct. So the Almighty says that, well, such people who, in spite of being convinced of the truth, they continue with this. So he orders, uh, for example, the elements of nature, earthquakes and, and tempests and other natural disasters to wipe out such nations. And this is what happened in the cases of many nations. And in the cases of some messengers like Prophet Muhammad wasallam himself, the, the task which was to be carried out or which was carried out through, through these uh, cyclones and through these... Uh, elements of nature to destroy people who had intentionally denied the truth. Uh, the task was given to the messengers of God and his uh, and his followers that the Almighty himself would uh, actually give this target to them that as instruments of God's justice on earth, they would implement this punishment to people uh, for denying the truth intentionally. So this is a law which is related specifically to this period. Now, if you don't understand law, what you will do is uh, you will end up becoming people like uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi or Osama bin Laden or Mullah Omar. And you would say, as you said, that, well, 
لقد كان لكم في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that in the act or practice of the messenger of god we have to follow whatever he does and since he punished people or since the almighty in the era of messenger of god punished people for their deliberate denial so we have the same prerogative and then they of course as you know uh, they they say that okay our enemy number one are the kuffar or the uh, are disbelievers without realizing that a person becomes a disbeliever or a kafir when he intentionally denies the truth and this intentional denial can only be known through wahi through mm-hmm. god himself even a messenger himself is not a position in, in not a position to pinpoint a person whether he is a kafir or not it is the almighty who mm-hmm. tells mm-hmm. people that now the truth has been conveyed the, in the ultimate sense and now if they deny then they are to be called as absolute deniers so mm-hmm. what has happened is that uh, the jews and the christians of the times of the prophet about whom mm-hmm. this deliberate denial was conveyed by by the almighty himself through to his prophets uh, they have been analogously regarded to be the same as the jews and christians of today and this is the biggest i think mistake or a misreading of the quran that has resulted in a lot of confusion so mm-hmm. ustaz hamid bin farahi you might be knowing him so he was teacher of ghandi sahab's teachers teacher i mean he was the teacher of uh, amin hasan islahi so he he is to his credit is this uh, very important uh, uh, i would say deduction which he made from the quran Uh, according to which this established practice of the almighty of destroying people in the prophetic era for deliberate denial is something which relates to this deliberate denial and is specific to that era it cannot be extended beyond the prophetic era and hence directives which are related to people or the adversaries and which have that harsh content or harsh ring about them cannot be extended to 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 the later people so for, for example jews and christians of today in any way they cannot be regarded as analogous to the jews and christians of prophetic times because one it was the prophet, prophet himself who was conveying the truth to them mm-hmm. two their denial was being communicated by none other than god himself to the prophet himself and he was told that well now that their time is up because they have they have been taking their uh, time they have been uh, enough has been uh, ha- enough has happened they have been conveyed the truth to the ultimate extent and now uh, it's always destruction that is going to await them and this is exactly similar what's going to happen on the day of judgment so people are going to be punished for deliberate denial of the truth on the day of judgment so all that has happened is that a small miniature rehearsal of that greater day of judgment has taken place in the era of a messenger of god so that people like us should be reminded time and again when we read the quran that yes if our judgment is not coming immediately right mm-hmm. after do a bad thing in this world it doesn't mean it will never come the only thing is it has been deferred to the day of judgment and hence all those directives which relate to punishment like mm-hmm. for example befriending non not befriending non muslims or not paying salutations to them not asking for their forgiveness not inheriting from them etc etc they are a class of directives a class of directives specifically related to the era of prophet muhammad this includes jizya this includes apostasy mm-hmm. apostasy again is something uh which is uh the punishment which was given to those people who had reverted back from faith to their original state because of the fact that they were associated partners with god and for such people the punishment in the hereafter is that they will not be forgiven so the same punishment was given to them or was supposed to be given to them in this world and if they reverted back to their own polytheistic practices they would be subject to death so therefore apostasy or punishment of uh, disbelief all these things are related to the specific era of a messenger of god they cannot be extra- extrapolated they cannot be extended to later mm. uh, to later periods and this is basically what has been done that things which were specific to an era they have been extended as i said so uh, I, uh, if you remember in 1994 uh, uh, Mustafa, osama bin laden actually came out of that famous council of hosts which took place in afghanistan and he said that uh, Uh, the us is their enemy number 1 and he cited the quran he said the, the quranic verse is qatilu aimmat al kufr that we that you fight with these leaders of disbelief and exactly all those verses which relate to a messengers of god uh, for a particular reason he read those verses and he said that well uh, this is our uh, this is something which has been asked of us as well so we yeah. also need to fight these people and and bring them to justice or bring them to uh, to subserve Is this what Ghamdi Saab, when he says Itmamul Hujja, right. is is speaking about when he his concept of Itmamul Hujja is that the the thing that the 
that, that it's only conclusively been settled for those people around the prophets. Around uh, the prophets. Not so those who come after. It was Ustaz Zamiruddin Farahi who, for the first time, so because we're living with, uh, in the era of uh, the third Farahi scholar, who was Ustaz Javed Ahmad Ghamidi, so he's, he's really uh, uh, made a, a very phenomenal contribution by presenting the views of Ustaz Amidin Farahi in a more precise and a more elaborate way. But we must give credit to this uh, particular uh, area in to, to Ustaz Amidin Farahi because he was the one who said that for, for a messenger of God, a court of justice for his nation is set up in this world. Mm -hmm. And and if you don't realize this, you'll end up understanding a lot of verses of the Quran uh, which do not relate to you simply because they relate to the presence of a messenger. So as soon as the messengers of God have gone away, uh, this practice is no longer in currency. And if you do so, you'll you'll be guilty of uh, actually playing God, which which means that in the era of messengers of God, it is basically God who is implementing this punishment. So mm -hmm. these messengers themselves are instruments of God's justice. They are not of doing course. anything of their own accord. So like angels were implementing certain things and they still do, in the era of, uh, in the prophetic era, it's basically uh, the messengers who are implementing the will of God. That will be implemented, obviously, on the day of judgment as well. So, but, if somebody, so if somebody asks, what is, what are, what is the purpose? I mean, it's a very, it's a simple question, but very obviously right. could be complex. Mm -hmm. That, what is the, what is the real purpose of Islam and Muslims? If somebody asks this, let's say taking them away from this, trying to take over the world and global dominion. And so what is the purpose? What what would you say to that, Sheikh? So I think uh, the, the, the Quran itself has, has told us that the purpose of religion is taskia, which means uh, purification of our deeds and practices, both at the individual level and at the collective level. So taskia is something which uh, the Quran has said is the purpose. And the verse which actually has, uh, which spells out this is the famous Surah Juma verse which says, So a messenger of God, he, he actually recites the verses of the Quran. And these verses are composed of two main categories, the Asharia part and the Al-Hikmah part. Mm -hmm. And once he conveys the Sharia and the Hikmah to the people, and makes them understand what this, what these two categories are. And if people are able to understand and uh, follow them, then the result of that is that you uh, get purified, you get the taskia individually and collectively. So basically it's taskia which is the purpose of religion. Or in fact, every directive of religion has the sole purpose of purifying our deeds and practices. And okay, and, and would you add an element of trying to serve people? Um, in in that as well. Obviously, this is, you see this 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 is something which is a offshoot of this. Uh, when you are asked to be a person who is sincere to your own fellow beings, because as the prophet himself has said, a deen and nasiha. Yeah. So you have to be a well wisher of people. You have. Sorry, I apologize, <laughs> but yeah, so, carry on. Sorry, you're, you're back. So you see, uh, the, as far as the hikmah, uh, just let me explain a little more. The components of religion, mm -hmm. which this particular verse of Surah Juma spells out, are two. So one of them is the Sharia, which is also called the Al-Kitab, which gives the directives. And the other one is Al-Hikmah, mm -hmm. which actually is composed of moral directives as well as our beliefs. Mm -hmm. So the beliefs, for example, the five beliefs, the belief in God and the prophet and the angels and the books and the last day. And then, of course, the morality, which means you have to be charitable to people, which means that you are uh, an individual who has to look out for other people. You are an individual who, who is ob obliged in, in, in all sorts that you just cannot be selfish. You have to be a person who's uh, looking after the cares of other people. So that is the, the hikmah part of, of the Quran itself. And because the Quran itself is the greatest means of taskia, so these verses, uh, which actually ask people to serve humanity or to serve their own cause and to serve the society that they live in and make a profound contribution, uh, they, of course, are part of our religion. The only thing is that we need to understand that the category uh, of which they form a part is, uh, is uh, the nomenclature that we use or the nomenclature which the Quran has used is al-hikmah, which means wisdom of religion. And it comprises, as I said, the beliefs, the belief structure and our morality. I see. I see. Shukran. No, I mean, that's uh, I was asking that because often it is asked and people do think, what you know, 
In many ways, the answer can be simple, yet it can be profoundly complex. But it is ultimately from it is simple as you take it that you are here to to. I mean, the faith is here to establish a connection between you and the divine and uh, the Tazki of which you, you spoke. And then the extension of that, the branches, it is to live your life in an exemplary way and to uh, and to serve others as well along the way on this journey. Uh, right. Speaking speaking of serving people, uh, Dr. Sarp, so the youth and the issues we spoke of previously um, uh, and saying that there's this rising um, kind of turbulence almost amongst younger people about the faith. I, I want to just, just drop in there as well. I feel sometimes, um, not I feel, but psychological studies and sociological studies argue that with the rising middle classes, you always get this um, this kind of uh, the, the, almost this uh, the, this turbulence that we're feeling amongst younger people, because, and it's happened. You know what they're going to say in the past in the West, and and it's happening now in in South Asia and other parts of the world where there is a rising middle class now in Pakistan. Very, I mean, profoundly. I mean, within the next, it's estimated, uh, you know, few decades. The, the the range of the middle class in Pakistan would be so vast comparatively with other countries because of the population scale. So, um, so so we see a lot more questions being asked sincerely, but sometimes that that are really existential and about the faith as a whole and challenging certain narratives. And it's in light of that you're doing this course, uh, I believe, and that's uh, you're hosting a course for young people. Uh, just very briefly, uh, before unpacking some of these topics, what is this? Tell us a bit about this course, because it's coming up, I believe, just within this coming week. So tell us a bit about that. It's aimed at young people. What, what are you aiming to get out of this? So uh, basically, this course has two uh I would say two modules or two, two distinct uh, 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 parts. So the first part is like an introduction to the Quran. Mm -hmm. So you see the, the youngsters or the young minds, before you even hand over a book of 500 pages like the Quran, uh, it's much more, uh, I would say, easier to make them first go through the introduction regarding a book which is of 500 or 600 pages so that they're able to have a background of the book that what, what exactly is the language of the book, what's the genre of the book, how is it structured, what is the history of the book, how are the directives spread out in it. So it's like it will first introduce the audience to a basic uh, background and introduction to the Quran. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second part is that there some selected verses of the Quran ha will be discussed so that uh, you are able to, uh, instead of giving the whole Quran to, to someone, uh, because of course, as I said, it's not easy for people to go through mm -hmm. that. So a selected portion of the Quran uh, would, it has been compiled and that is something that they would be given in the form of a booklet so that uh, before even entering the, the complete Quran, they, are, have, they have a glimpse. So if they have an introduction to the Quran first, then they have a glimpse of the Quran. And once they have gone through this, uh, people who are entrusted, they will be said, yes, now is the time that you pick up the Quran as a whole. Mm -hmm. And now you just dive into it. And, uh, and, and this is not something that's going to end after about a year or so. It's like a lifelong attachment to the book of God. So once the the access to the book of God has been opened to you uh, by knowing exactly what is the structure, the background and the language and the knowledge, and you've also been exposed to a particular group of selected verses uh, of the Quran, now is the time that you can pick up the Quran and uh, have a lifelong relationship with the book of God. And it's like opening that path for them. Okay. And then this, the second module of the of uh, this course is that uh, they are basically uh, given certain glimpses of certain questions that might have arisen in their minds. For example, uh, why is it that we are required to, uh, I mean, we are so strict in our diet and why is it that halal meat or zabiyah is so essential for us? Or why is it that we need to pray five times a day? Why is it that we have to fast for a whole month? And why is it that we are we have to abstain from liquor? Or why is it that women have to follow a particular dress code? If at all, it is something that we think it is a code because there is a wide variety of uh, interpretations as how women or men have to dress up. Is beard something which is compulsory? Uh, is wearing a particular dress 
compulsory. How is it that could you befriend uh, boys and girls? Could they befriend one another? Because of, after all, they are uh, they are studying in the same institutions, and it's, it's difficult that you don't, don't befriend each other. And it's like you just cannot isolate yourself. So, what are the norms uh, through which you can conduct yourself with the opposite gender? Uh, and then things like music, uh, for example, that uh, can uh, boys and girls they can enjoy music or they can sing uh, uh, various songs or play certain instruments. Why? Songs of religion, and then the fine arts, for example, sculpture, okay. for example, making portraits or images. Because as we know, the classical stance is that uh, the pictures of living beings are prohibited. So therefore, uh, generally, people are people think that they just cannot make any. Uh, portraits and pictures, and they cannot even take these uh, pictures and hang them in their uh, rooms, and and the list goes on. For for example, that uh, so this is all part of the second module. All of these topics. Of right. It's quite a quite a bit of uh, <laughs> mashallah, quite a bit of uh, <laughs> I was going to say masala worth of controversy in in those right. in those things. I love that you're tackling it, but you know, taking the bull by the horns and and just just, just one yeah. thing that I'd like to always add is you see. Uh, when we are studying religion, we have to understand one thing, and that is that it is our humble understanding of yeah. certain issues. We are not claiming that we are absolutely right. Of course, we could of course. be we could be wrong. This is how we have understood. Yeah. And the message that that needs to be put across is that religion is not something to be emotionally attached with. Uh, of course, it is something, but emotions should come later on. First, you must understand. Use your intellect. The, the Quran specifically says that uh, you must use your intellect. You must think on what the Quran is, is telling you. Mm -hmm. These are the things that all of us have been told to. So if yeah. you are faced with a new interpretation, or, or some scholar says that this is another My apologies once again, people. Okay. So you see, <laughs> yeah. what... what teach our young minds is that they must analyze an opinion on the basis of the arguments that are proffered, that are presented. Mm -hmm. And some of the arguments might not appeal to them, so okay, they're fine, they can reject that opinion. So basically, it's an intellectual approach to religion through yeah. which they must understand certain directives of Islam, why they should do certain things, and why they should not do certain things. And once they understand this, they must also realize that their understanding can falter as well. So today, if you think something is right, uh, yeah. Along the road, maybe you go along and you find out that maybe I was understanding something and someone c corrected me or my own uh, intellect corrected me. So it's like a continuous journey yeah. that we have to undertake, understand religion. And we, uh, inshallah, will not be held accountable for even our erroneous opinions if we make them sincerely. If we sincerely come to an opinion uh, exactly. with all honesty, uh, we have this example in the Quran which tells us that God will hold us accountable according to our own understanding. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell people of, often in, in my kind of show, especially the, the meaning with Malm, that, look, what matters is your devotion to Allah. Um, if you, I tell people, like when I answer some of these questions, um, let's say on music or any of these, that, look, this, for example, this is an understanding. This is what some people have said. Some people, you know, you may be somebody uh, who believes music is haram. If that's you... Don't listen to it. You know, right. that's you, you. There's nothing wrong. Nobody's going to come and say, you better listen to music. Mm. That's fine. We respect your interpretation. This is mm. also an interpretation. You know, there's Absolutely. many ulama with this. And it's ultimately about a devotion uh, mm -hmm. that each person has with God. It's not about you know, policing. You know, lasta alim bi musaytar. You're not here to kind of force police other people in that sense. Um but yeah, so, I mean, a lot of these topics that you've said, they're, they're, I think they're really uh, epic. I'd love to, uh, if we can unpack maybe some of them. Um, so you've started with the first of the first module you've mentioned. OK, uh, it's more about uh, giving people a kind of access, a portal to the Quran. OK, we understand that. Now, the second module, which was more, I think, what people would be curious about, especially young people, you've touched up on things like relationships, you've touched up on uh, entertainment, you've touched up on beliefs and struggles that people may be kind of questioning. Um, yeah, I mean, let's what is let me start with this. What is a common question that you get asked 
in Pakistan today? What, what, do, what do you think? That's, that's controversial of this part. What is a common one that you think, you know what, that's probably, he has to make the top three that I get right. always asked. Yeah. I think the greatest or the most frequently asked single question, whether you're in Pakistan, whether you're in Canada or the US or Australia, I would say the top question is that... Uh, how, do, how do we all go on to mind trap with Mufti Abulay? <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> one, day, one day maybe. <laughs> so the top question is that did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu marry a six-year-old girl, uh, Aisha Jitala Anha? So I think this is the, the, this is the question which is, which is the most uh, frequent question if people are allowed to ask because at times yeah. you don't give them this opportunity. At times they are... They, they, they fear that if they ask this question, uh, they might get scolded. But if you are given this, you give them this freedom that they can come up with any question. I think this is the foremost question that I have faced wherever I have gone. And uh, and people are, are genuinely perplexed. Of course, we're talking about Muslims. We're not even talking about non-Muslims. We're talking about Muslims, young Muslims, young minds and even adults and not comprehending that. Well, is was this the case that he married a minor, so, so to speak? Uh, and of course, uh, this is this is a very very important that we have a very. Uh, I mean, of course, we have an answer to that. But I, in my personal opinion, think that the traditional answer, which is given in this regard, is uh, is absolutely incorrect. And uh, the age of Aisha has been wrongly extrapolated and calculated on the basis of certain narratives. We have alternative information which uh, uh, which tells us that she was 19 or 21 years old at the time of her marriage. It's absolutely incorrect uh, that she was six years old and uh, when she was uh, uh, restored to the Prophet himself. Uh, and then uh, after that, I would say the second most common question relates to sexual uh, areas, for example, masturbation. That is it oh, uh, something yeah. which uh, which men and women have been, have been disallowed um, uh, and uh, is it that uh, we cannot indulge in this? Is it a sin to masturbate? So this is the second most common question. And probably if I can go on if you if you ask for the first two. This, these are the first two that I. <laughs> you know, just uh, just on these, since these are incredibly pertinent, especially the first one. And we'll come to the second as well. Obviously, very important. I'm sure a lot of the viewers are thinking, <laughs> don't leave that one out. Uh, but the, this recently, there was this whole issue in India with uh, Nupur Sharma who spoke out on this blasphemy. And it triggered this debate once again, because um, obviously she said it in a rude tone and she was being disparaging. And that's a different issue because sometimes it's not even, you see, the issue is sometimes not about the detail, mm -hmm. but it's about how, so if a person is poor and I'm, I'm this is a poor analogy as well, but I'm just giving an example. Somebody says, you know, you, 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 you know, this person's so poor, they're, you know, tramp or they like this. And they may be poor and they may be home, but there's an insulting element to it that is a person is is deriding uh, when they're saying that. Now, she obviously was speaking about something and she said, well, you know, I we can say stuff about the Prophet Muhammad as well. And she started saying, you know, he married and bedded a child and things like this. And, and then later on, uh, she did try to say, I think, I was just stating what the Muslims believe. I didn't realize I was saying anything. Uh, you know, what have I said? She said, like, well, I wasn't being blasphemous. I was just saying what they themselves say in their books. And then later on, she apologized when she had pressure, international pressure, saying, look, if I upset you, I don't mean to. And she got sacked. But um, so clearly, I, I understand her intent. There was, and it's difficult to judge intent, but it appears that she was trying to do something to uh, to kind of be, to instigate and be rude. I get that. Put that aside. But her point that, look, Muslims say this stuff anyway, mm -hmm. um, it started this whole debate. Uh, mm. Again, I've, I was noticing a lot of people, especially from that part of the world, uh, discussing this again. Is the is this now, is the tide slightly changing in Pakistan? Because there was a time where, you know, I know Ramdi Saab was teaching this, but I don't know if anybody really, I thought you know, there was a time when it was really difficult to just challenge this narrative even. Do you feel it's changing or is it still really difficult? I think it's still the same. If if not, it has even gone uh, more worse, uh, to, so to speak. Uh, because you see, uh, 
uh, there is this uh, traditional understanding, uh, and you are very well aware of that, that uh, if there is a narrative which has found its place in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, then it is virtually, mm. uh, I mean, it's, it's like the word of God himself. It's, it's almost the same. So if they think that because of the fact that Aisha's age, the Ta'ala Anha, has been mentioned so in the, in, in the Hadith or the Hadith of Bukhari, so uh, if a person says uh, this is not true or this is not uh, correct, then obviously the, the backlash is very strong. And you're absolutely right that if you take away the disparaging element of Nurpur Sharma's uh, uh, words, uh, again, that can be discounted as well because when a person is angry, this is, yeah. this is something mm. natural to happen. But the content is absolutely correct. I mean, what wrong did she, did she, she state except the stance of the common Muslim uh, traditionalists who say that, yes, she was six years old at the time of marriage and she was brought home and she was nine. So uh, uh, what exactly went wrong there and why exactly did she need to apologize? Of course, as you said, uh, pressure was there. But uh, I think this also reflects on the approach that we Muslims have. We are generally reactionary. Hmm. So instead of, I think, trying to calm down people by answering the questions at hand and neglecting the, 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 the anger or the hatred hmm. that the other person might have, you must address people, uh, address the question at hand. A very hmm. similar approach was adopted uh, during the ca cartoon controversy in Denmark, which started off uh, a decade ago. Uh, and I distinctly remember uh, a cartoon uh, which was actually making fun of the fact that uh, a martyr who is going to, I mean, a person who is going to die as a martyr mm -hmm. is going to be given 72 virgins in, in paradise. Mm -hmm. So there was a placard which they placed in, on, the, on a person who was supposed to be Prophet Muhammad. And the placard read that, well, stop killing people because heaven is running out of virgins. Because of uh, the fact that uh, you think that you're going to get married. So I think the proper way would have been that you neglect the, 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 the disparaging tone because yeah. people have a right to disparage, and of course, I mean, I'm not condoning disparagement, but this is what. They're, but, but I mean, they're non-Muslim anyway, so they yeah. don't really believe in Islam. Substance. Yeah, the substance is that. Well, is it that really a martyr is going to be rewarded with 72 virgins? Is it something which is authentically mentioned in the Quran or Hadith? So I think instead of being, instead of reacting to these things, the proper way would have been, and still is, that you either own up to the fact that yes, this is what the Quran says or the Hadith says, or if there is an alternative explanation, you try to make sense of that. Yeah. There's no absolutely point in getting angry or taking out these loads and loads of people on the roads and uh, uh, ca causing vandalism and destruction or wasting the time of people. This is, this is the mentality of people who, are, who have themselves perhaps lost mm -hmm. their own cause. How can they, uh, I mean, how can, if they are justifying something which they, they are justifying, yeah. then I think if a person is, is criticizing your prophet or he or she has a different view, I think that it's, it's the right I, of that person. I, I find it strange that, you see, it's, it's, it's so, I mean, somebody could just do a PhD on what's going on in this places like Pakistan. Because, you see, the populace, the general population, the hard line, let's say, traditional conservative kind of Islamic view is Hanafi in Madhab. Right. Now, Hanafi in Madhab doesn't really uh, accept as a fiqh the superiority of Sahih al-Bukhari. It doesn't really because most of the Hanafi fiqh is actually against what is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And so when we teach, when, sorry, when we studied Dawra Hadith, they would always tell us that, look, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, we don't have to accept these things in Sahih Bukhari. And, and that's being taught in all the madrasas. And in fact, Imam Bukhari, when, because in his Sahih Bukhari says, Qala ba'dun nas, some people said, and by that, they believe he's talking about Imam Abu Hanifa. And they believe he's saying it slightly, maybe disparagingly. This is what they feel, Allahu A'lam. That uh, a lot of them, when, when we cover that in madrasa, they're very upset. Like, you know, this is Imam Bukhari. And, you know, in fact, our teacher as well said, uh, you know, he's passed away now, Mufti Naim Sahib. May Allah bless his afterlife. But he said as well, you know, Qiyamat ke din Imam Bukhari ko gareban se pakdenge. And, you know, what the hell? How can he say, Qala ba'dun nas Imam Abu Hanifa? You know, it's like, say, but when it comes to this issue, it's it's interesting that the, it's like the manhad changes because I don't. It's like if we could do, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? It's it's like what what's actually going on because you you'll do ta'wil interpretation of so much of Bukhari quite comfortably, 
and you don't you're not fussed whether the hadiths in Bukhari doesn't have to apply. In fact, most of Bukhari doesn't apply to Hanafi fiqh. And this mas'ala, I feel this mas'ala is more tied into a reaction from colonialism. You know, this kind of, uh, it's a weird reactionary bravado, like, uh, so what? If it's if it said you know like the the it's in that the you know the prophet let's say married her she was this she was this old nine years old uh, so what like we don't need the West to tell us that this is wrong uh, I I feel sometimes it's coming from that angle I mean what what are you, what are your because people in Pakistan don't normal people don't accept that for themselves they wouldn't accept like if even let's say eleven year old. If somebody came for their 10, 11 year old daughter, they would beat the hell out of them. They wouldn't accept these things uh, in the real world. Nobody, Muslims don't accept this in the real world. So this issue, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's a, a strange one. <laughs> it, is, it is. Actually, what has happened also is that, as you rightly said, that the Hanafis are pitched against the uh, certain, certain narratives in Bukhari. But the fact is that the impact of hadith is has been so strong that even the Hanafis have become, so to yeah, speak, yeah. alul hadith, and they have been yeah. deeply impacted by that. Yeah. And whether they believe something for their own children or not, but if it's something which is uh, described by Bukhari regarding the Prophet, and if it's it's not as correct, they they would say this is absolutely correct. And uh, what, what I mean, this is a this is a something of a custom of the era of those times. And if we married someone about which everyone was okay about because the custom was there and the tradition was there that you could marry underage uh, girls. So what is the whole the noise about? So this is how they would typically justify uh, such such rulings. Yeah, and I've seen people say this and I've said, I mean, I've got a detailed video on this, but I've said that, look, there is a difference between People, so people will say often, oh, if I, if you go back to my grandma's mom's time, sh they were getting married when they were about 14, sometimes 13, sometimes 15, you know, between this age, people will say this. And sure, that has been happening throughout the world. But people generally weren't marrying little, little girls, generally like yeah. six-year-old, seven-year-old girls. That wasn't generally happening. Even I've heard tr people try to say... Um, Oh, this was something the Arabs used to do. Where? I mean, there's nothing. There's, where does it say that the Arabs used to marry little girls? Where? Like, and this, and sometimes they confuse this with the mas'ala that can you do aqdun nikah? Can you marry someone, like do a nikah of somebody if they're a child? So, for example, and, and this is a good one, I think it's worth bringing up. Uh, some people shared with me recently because of this age of Aisha that, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu daughters uh, were all married and and they tried to calculate the age. So they say, apart from Fatima radiallahu anha, they say, oh, well, Zainab and Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum. And so they were all had their nikah done and two were, Zainab was with, uh, uh, with Abu al-As. But um, the other two were with the sons of Abu Lahab. Lahab. And, and so they work out the age. So they say, well, you know, such and such was born when the Prophet was 30 something. And when he became, received wahi, uh, Abu Lahab broke off. He said, look, break off the nikah. So see, so they must have been married and they were seven uh -huh. years old. Um, mm. And I don't know if you've seen this. I've seen these articles going around saying, right. uh, mm. and, and this was not... A, this was very what we would call, or people, I guess, in the, in the Indo Pak thing would just call, uh, I guess, today like a mangni, or it would be they wouldn't have used the word engagement. They would have just done a nikah, yeah. but it wasn't something like a, they weren't living together. Like it was just spoken for betrothed to, mm -hmm. uh, unless the uh, unless they were. And the other thing was when the Prophet received wahi, mm -hmm. immediately there wasn't. Um, I mean, there's almost an 18 month gap till the next Wahi right. and there isn't initially people haven't turned against him so strongly straight away. It takes, a, you know, it takes a little while. Um, and so the eldest daughter, Zainab, does marry during that time because uh, Abul As says that, you know, he refuses to break it off and, and goes ahead with it. But it didn't mean that the two younger daughters of the Prophet um uh, Ruqayya and uh, uh, Umm Kulthum were living in 
um, what is it, married into like a proper cohabiting relationship with the sons of Abu Lahab. So I just thought that was an important point because I've seen a few people, you know, throw these things around recently on Facebook. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's, it, I, th I think this is such an, I'm really glad that there is, that y you guys are tackling this, that you are a, a voice of reason. Um, I, I wonder if uh, some people have asked me, uh, not to sidetrack too much on it, but just briefly, I have in some videos explained that I feel that the whole part of the whole misunderstanding here was um, was Hisham, um, or the Rawi Hisham, and all the riwayat, and there's many riwayat on mm. all of them. I've got this chart of them. There's mm. somebody who's doing a PhD on it. And it's really fascinating, actually, because... Um, He's not even a Muslim. And it's it's really, uh, I'll try and, you know, until he agrees, I can't, uh, if he comes on mind trap. This guy used to be an Islamophobe. And he used to hate on Islam. Um, he wasn't from, I think he was from Australia or something, I don't know. But he's uh, a, a white person, didn't hated Islam. And one of the things he would always attack was the age of Aisha. So he'd say, you know, the Prophet was, they would say, well, ahiyyatu billah, things like the Prophet was a pedophile and things. Now, he this was something he knew a lot about. Like he would say, oh, this, this, Ibn Hisham says in the Sirah, blah, blah, blah. You know, he's memorized all these little stats. Um, so what happened is he ended up doing a, a master's in it because he thought, well, you know, I know this and I'll really ragged the Muslims and, you know. So... As he started to do it, he, he got more and more into this thing and he started to and he said he was going with this theory. He spoke to me, I think, last year and he said to me, look, I there was a point where I believed that this had to be true because the Muslims themselves mention it, because if it wasn't true, they they would have uh, they would never have mentioned it. The fact that it's true and Muslims are mentioning it must be true. Otherwise, they would have buried it kind of thing. This was right. his his kind of theory. And then he said, I came across a point where I thought to myself, he started, he went on to do a PhD, mm -hmm. right? So on the age of Aisha. And he said that I thought to myself that, wait a minute, could this, like he was just trying to play devil's advocate, that like, could this be false? And he ended up coming up with so many valid answers on how this age of Aisha could be false. And he was really baffled. And then he re the, the answers were so compelling that he changed his whole PhD. And he did a whole PhD on all the Asanid. And he, he drew these like wonderful, elaborate charts. He shared some with me. And he's got every single Sanat that is to do with the age of Aisha. And there's so many. Um, and he shows that all the ru all the ruat, the narrators at the final level are Iraqi. Every single one at the lower and he's got them color coded. Mm -hmm. So you could see he, he had them like blue for Iraq and you could see the whole thing at the lower la level before it reaches the transmitters is all Iraq. And he then connects it to Ibn Hisham as well, because we were having this discussion then. And so but it's just. Uh, people have asked me, I've thought in the future, inshallah, I will try to do something on the Isnadi thing. I wonder if I want to ask if Ghamdi Saab was planning on doing something like that uh, on unpacking the the Isnad angle or is that something he's not looking to do? Well, actually, uh, because of the fact that uh, this might be an additional information uh, in unpacking the Isnad and also proving the yeah. fact that it all converges to one narrator and hence it could be a Gharib narrative. Uh, there is some alternative, I would say, evidence, which is stronger, even stronger. Sure. And that has been actually brought to light by the, the likes of uh, Hakim Niaz Ahmed of Deoband. Uh, mm -hmm. This is about almost 100, maybe uh, 70 or 80 years ago. Then we have Habibur Rahman Kandalvi, again, okay. a very respected authority. So the evidence that I uh, always present uh, as an alternative or a counter evidence is basically from their works and which they have shown that if you leave the, this narrative of Bukhari aside and look into the sources of history, you'll find a completely different picture. Yeah. And the way they go about describing this is that, well, all of our history books, they tell us that uh, Asma, anha, who was the elder sister of Aisha, yeah. uh, so all sources tell us that she was 10 years older to her. Yeah. Asma was 10 years older to Aisha. 
And then our history books also tell us that she died, Asma died uh, in 72 Hijra when she was 100 years old. She had a very long life. Yeah. Uh, she was, um, uh, I mean, she had this uh, age of 100. So if this is correct, then uh, a simple calculation will tell us that if she died in 72 Hijra at the age of 100, she would be 28 years old at the time of Hijra. Yeah. And since, since she was 10 years older to Aisha, so yeah. Aisha must be 18 years old in, yeah. in, in, at the time of Hijra. And if that is correct, all sources also tell us and all traditional scholars also believe that the Nikah of Aisha took place in Mecca yeah. and the city or the departure took place two years even after that uh, near the Battle of Badr. So if at the age of 18, the Nikah was conducted around about that age. And the Rukhsati of the departure took place even two years after that, which makes it around 20, 19 and a half or 20. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's it's so such a simple calculation. And he has yeah. shown that these historical uh, sources, they, they tell us the dates of death and birth. And they clearly tell us that Asma Anha was 10 years older. And if that is the case, then a simple calculation would tell us that she was 18 at the time of Nikah and 20 near the time of uh, when she and this, and this is a Diobandi scholar. That's, yeah, he, he's okay. a Diobandi scholar. Okay. No, and, I was uh, very familiar with the research, but I wasn't familiar that it was a Diobandi scholar. His, his full name is Niaz Ahmad Diobandi. I mean, wow. he writes Niaz Ahmad Diobandi is, in wow. his... Uh, okay. That's... And so I think that uh, this alternative evidence plus yeah. the fact, I mean, this is one of the, uh, yeah, this just is one, of the one price, yeah. yeah. Uh, other than that, he has presented other proofs as well. Thus, he has presented the fact that she was previously in the nikah of, uh, of someone else, Muthamim yeah. Adi, the yeah. son of him. And uh, uh, the, the, the way that has been mentioned, her name has been mentioned in, in a lot of narratives, uh, tell us that she was a grown up woman. And that yeah. the Arabic words which are used for, would describe a woman. Because I mean, the, the narration, one of the narrations says that when her mother-in-law of the time broke off her her right. kind of nikah, her engagement, if you want to say engagement, but that kind of nikah, broke it off, the excuse the riwayat say is she said, Aksha and Tusbi'ahu, that we, yeah, that we fear that she will convert him. Mm. Now, what if she was six? And he was a grown man. <laughs> I right. mean, what kind right. of a grown man is going to get converted mm -hmm. into a faith by a little right. child? Uh, mm -hmm. The fact that the mother-in-law is thinking, you know what, I don't like this. This, I fear she's going to convert my son to this new faith mm -hmm. shows that she is of age and of reason. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I think and, that yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just yeah. going to say that, and, and a beautiful point that w which I have mentioned in my video, and Ramdi Saab's mentioned it as well. You know, credit to Ramdi Saab. That look, if you approach this just from a holistic perspective, and you see the fact that in Amul Huzn, that the Prophet وسلم, with the loss of Khatija, with the loss of Abu Talib, with the loss of his familial structure, the backbone from his home, his family has gone, his societal social protection has gone. And then to add to the tragedy, the devastation of uh, Ta'if and being attacked and all of this and how it could really take somebody down and, you know, try and dampen and crush their spirits. In this time, Khola approaches the Prophet to say that, why don't you marry? Because mm. you've got children at home, you know, right. you, you need someone, it'll give you emotional support, moral support, support, you take care of your family. You know, it'll give you also an in intimacy as a partner. It will be something so meaningful, it could help you with the message. Uh, and then she suggests two people, I mean, Saudab also, oh, uh, yeah. uh, and Aisha. Now, the fact that why, if Aisha was six, seven, and the Prophet says, okay, yeah, you're right. I've got, you know, I've got young children at home. I've got all of these. Why don't I just bring home another child? Another child. That, that doesn't make any sense. It's like, well, what's the point of that? If I bring home another child, then I'm just more laden with responsibility. How, how is that helping me? I think this, you know, this, this holistic angle, more than anything... It kind of seals the, it just brings clarity that, wow, that, that's so true. At a time of distress, the, the Prophet needed support and, it's, and and the wife would have helped him in so many things, taking care of the house and the message right. and working mm -hmm. the Prophet, all of these things. But 
Yeah, and I I just think that's so. It's so I'm I'm so glad that these things are being raised and are being discussed. Alhamdulillah, and I and I and it is going to be a journey, but Alhamdulillah that we but the journey's begun, and you know people are coming towards it. They are thinking, look, this isn't kufar, you know, stop this blackmailing, and if we don't believe it, we don't believe it. At the end of the day, it's khabru ahad. Khabru Ahad is not Qat'i in Aqeedah, according to, you know, most Sunni scholars. So, yeah. But so shukran for, for sharing that. Coming to some of the other, uh, okay, so some of the other questions and topics as well for your course. Uh, mm -hmm. Sexual issues. Okay, this this is a, a big uh, topic, as I can imagine. Um, you know, before getting into this, I wanted to th throw a question right at you that... Um, Sheikh, you see, speaking of nikah and relationships, and this is what you're going to be speaking about on your course. Uh, traditionally, in Islam, we had something called, and we still have it in the fiqh, Sharia books, guidance books, called kafa'a, this kind of, uh, that there is a compatibility. And, uh, and people disagreed, what should compatibility be? Should it be social status? Should it be piety? Should it be whatever? And sure, wherever you are, you know, whatever works. But the question is as well that in this day and age, uh, what do people do with you know with the with the growing curiosity and 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 just kind of liberal lifestyle, I guess? What about sexual compatibility? Now, this is something which uh, is like a huge spanner in the works, uh, I guess, because it's like, well, how how does religion get around that one because it's it's like uh, okay because people would say look in the past everybody you know they, they kind of shared a similar social mindset and everybody just kind of mm -hmm. got on with it and there was a pragmatism to relationships and and nowadays in certain parts of the world maybe more so in developed parts of the world that you could for example there could be a doctor living next door to somebody who's just a a, a death metal fan you know music fan who's a punk who's living next door to somebody who's uh i don't know something else and so, and people have just got bizarre diverse interests and that's in life but sure but also uh, the sexual, not the sexuality, but the sexual kind of compatibility has begun to vary. So, so people sometimes are much more promiscuous. Some people then I'm not saying humans are more promiscuous, definitely. But I'm just saying sometimes some people are more promiscuous than others. This leads to a lot of clashes. I'm sure you get all these questions all the time. People saying because you'll get sometimes girls will be, especially in Pakistan, uh, and they they're not exposed to so much you know craziness and some of the guys are they they're watching all kinds of things online they're doing all kinds of stuff and then you know they get married and it's like well this is a complete mismatch and mm -hmm. so yeah I, I don't know if you, this is a question that y you've uh, been is. dealing with uh, absolutely i mean you see uh, because of pornography being available so freely uh, you just click a button and it's there right on the phone so there are all sorts of uh, different uh, forums which have evolved, like, for example, uh, things as, as necrophiliacs who, oh, yeah. who satisfy their lust to, uh, from dead bodies. And we have uh, uh, people like uh, satisfy their lust from through animals. Yeah. And similarly, uh, amongst, uh, amongst human beings, the most common is oral sex and anal sex. Okay. So the the fact that uh, whether it is allowed or not, and because uh, husbands and wives they they, they think that they are uh, I mean they are like uh, garments to one another. So is it that uh, oral sex uh, is allowed or anal sex is allowed? Or, okay. And these are the things which uh, don't think that uh, Pakistan is a, is a country in which uh, uh, girls are not exposed to all this stuff. You see, internet is now found in villages as well. Okay. Not just the cities. So <laughs> long live the internet. <laughs> it's, it's, it's everywhere, and people have. You know, it's like that saying things. that somebody said that they went to a remote village, they couldn't find clean water, but you could find Coca Cola. <laughs> Coca Cola, and you find the internet because the smartphones. You see, the smartphones mm. have have given this breakthrough, and they're like a computer that you have, and almost. I mean, the the remotest of areas uh, would have a smartphone available, a service available. So because of this, a uh, lot of, as you said, promiscuity or deviant sexual behaviors or whatever you can call them, mm -hmm. uh, because of the fact that they have now become an industry, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, pornography has become a very huge industry uh, and uh, it's so easily accessible that all these things are now readily available to even younger minds at a very younger yeah. age. I, I remember uh, back in 1981, this is, this is 42 years, 41 years ago, wow. I was in Chicago uh, and uh, there was this, and this is 40 years ago, there, there was a slogan which this, these girls had in a, in a particular school and it read, sex at eight. Otherwise, it's too late. Sex at what? Sex at sex at eight. Eight years. Eight. Sex at eight. Otherwise, it's too late. Okay. So, I mean, you see, what what I'm trying to tell you is that the 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 amount or the extent of uh, uh, that's promiscuity very disturbing. Is, is not. Yeah. It's just become prominent today because of the social media and the other tools that we are that are available. Otherwise, promiscuity or deviant behavior or uh, very early exposure to sex has always been there. You read about the Romans, you read about the Greek, you read about the Indians, you read about the Chinese. Uh, you'll find, uh, I mean, everything is there. Every, I mean, something that you cannot even imagine at times would be uh, found there uh, in, in a very graphic way. It's just that today, that graphic, those graphic details, which were generally in the form of texts, now mm -hmm. they have become visually available yeah. and people are, uh, are practicing them. So when this is the case, then uh, this, the, the battle for purification or the struggle towards purifying your nafs, you see, how, look at what how Islam approaches that. Islam, mm -hmm. at the very beginning, it tells you that you must guard your gaze, not let, let it take undue liberty. So the, the eyes are the, the window of the heart. I mean, if you just mm -hmm. your heart wants to stare out, it is through your eyes. And if this is the fundamental way in which Islam wants us to tackle promiscuity or wantonness or lust, it says that you must uh, guard your gaze, not let it uh, take undue liberty, uh, look towards other women as if they are your sisters or your daughters like that. Uh, and uh, of course, you're able to talk to them, you can talk to them, but uh, the, it has to be in a very restrained way. So it is like putting a barrier at a very earliest stage. Mm -hmm. Now, what has happened is that uh, this guarding of gaze or this this ghazul uh, basar, as the Quran says, yeah. no longer features, it no longer features in any educative setup that relates to, uh, I mean, which relates to uh, in a way that you need to educate your child as a parent or maybe as a teacher, that yeah. this is a fundamental tenet of Islam. And uh, when things go out of hand, uh, do we realize that we had have actually uh, the thing that we had to stop at a very early stage or a very very previous stage uh, because we are not able to do that uh, we are now running into all kinds of problems yeah. so you see particularly would not I mean of course this is a uh, because of the fact that it's easily available and it's yeah just sure I mean and it's so flooded and you're right it's very worrying especially for the younger the people but coming to this uh, let's say you know the people we're talking about adults and these questions that are being thrown especially since you've opened the can of worms and you've said things like okay oral sex anal sex these kind of questions being very common um right how do you go about tackling that dr Saf? how do you what do you say to these students first, the first thing that you need to understand is that we must not make this a taboo subject okay i mean this is nothing to be ashamed of this is nothing uh, to be uh, uh, i mean should not be a prohibited or a forbidden fruit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question which stares every single person. I mean, mm -hmm. all of us mm -hmm. are faced with this question as soon as we enter adolescence uh, and the desire uh, for sex is ignited in us. So everyone is faced with this question. The only thing is that we at times don't discuss these things or we do certain things without discussing them. Uh, we might not find out the stance of religion about them or we might be uh, very shy or we might be very guilty Mm -hmm. uh, not knowing whether a certain practice is is allowed or not. So because uh, I deal with the youth a lot of times, uh, and this is, as I said, the, the second most important question which uh, which boys or girls they raise if they are given this liberty to talk, uh, that whether they can indulge uh, in, in masturbation or if they get married, if is it okay that they have oral sex or anal sex or is it something just prohibited? So. See, I think what I try to do and present is the understanding of religion uh, or, for example, how if we have a certain advice from the Prophet or from the Quran itself and, and, 
and try to make sense of that by telling them that, well, this is the reason why something is not prohibited and this is the reason why it is. But yeah. what the important thing is that in order to derive a particular prohibition, you have to be a right, you have to go yeah. to the right place. You must, you cannot deduce something from a wrong instance. Yeah. So, for example, if I take up the case of masturbation first, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find there are two areas uh, or the two, there are two categories through which it is regarded to be prohibited generally by our uh, by our religious scholars. First is the Quranic verse and second is the Hadith. So uh, let me first uh, start off with the Hadith which says uh, something like Naqihul Yad al malun which says, which says oh, that right. anyone okay. who indulges in, 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 the, in the practice of your hands, he's, he's accursed. Mm -hmm. Now you'll find that this narrative is, is not even authentic, it does not even go back to the Prophet, it is not ascribed to him in any way and it is more of a a weapon which the clergy uses to, yeah. to to antagonize young minds that this is a, a, a cursed practice. It is something which yeah. only Satan would indulge in. As far as the Quran is concerned, this is just one word which is used to tell people that, well, this is a sin and you just cannot indulge into it. And the verse is, uh, So it says that uh, they are, these are people or these believers are, are such noble people that they don't uh, they, they, they protect their organs except for their wives. Mm -hmm. So this verse is taken to mean that uh, uh, the only form of sexual activity that is allowed in Islam is when you have a wife with you uh, and uh, you are able to indulge in, in sex with her. Uh, not realizing the fact that, uh, uh, the, the, that this verse is not at all talking about masturbation in any way. What it is talking about is that when a second partner is involved, when a second party is involved, it yeah. cannot be someone other than your wife. You cannot indulge in extramarital relations. Wherever it occurs in the Quran, it is actually proscribing extramarital relations. You cannot have out of wedlock. And this in no way, I mean, protecting your private parts does not mean that uh, masturbation or self-gratification is because, being discussed. I mean, there. not just, I mean, being, I guess, pedantic and just uh, the devil's advocate, one could say, well, uh, illa ala azwajim, o ma malakat aymanuhum, you know, or what their right hand right. possess. And so, one could say, see, well, you know, cases, if the hands possess it. <laughs> yeah, both cases, there is an individual involved. Mm -hmm. Either it's the slave girl of those yeah. times or your wife. So we see what is being prohibited is that outside of your wedlock, uh, I mean, you just cannot indulge in any relation. Either it has to be your wife or in the particular scenario of those times, your slave women, who, which was, of course, later on, uh, it was, they were, slavery was abolished. As you can know, it's a separate topic that we can discuss. Sure. So what the Quran, the point that the Quran is actually making here is that indulging in extramarital relations is prohibited. So deriving uh, the prohibition of masturbation from this verse is, a, is a, as we say, in, in fiqh, it's bina ul fasid al al fasid. It is something which itself is not established and you're establishing something on an unestablished thing or a yeah. de-established thing. So I, I would say that if this yeah. is the case, then there is no directive in the Quran or the Hadith which prohibits this. Yeah. I mean, this doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, you start doing this in, in a way that you just uh, start gratifying yourself all the time. No, <laughs> what I'm saying is... What I, don't, saying, I don't think anybody's uh, going to incessantly yeah. non-stop. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is this saying is that basically religion has not stopped us from this practice, but that doesn't mean that, for example, for health reasons maybe, or for some other reasons in which you are indulging in pornography and then indulging in masturbation or doing some other things first, which make you uh, gratify yourself. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's a ratifying and, You justice. know, running the logic, I mean, if we were to compute the logic ad absurdum, um, just saying, and I remember just to, you know, extend that, let's say the antagonist argument, the adversarial argument that all of these scholars that say, let's say all the scholars who say it's haram, because obviously you have scholars who say it's not haram, like Ibn Hazm and many others, and they quote the Salaf and right. so on. But you'll have many scholars saying, look, oh, this is haram because of these reasons, like, oh, it, only your wife or your partner let's say if it's wife or husband, whatever. Now, but all of these scholars agree that the the spouse, so be it the husband or the wife, can masturbate the other. Mm -hmm. So so they all agree that, so let's say, let's take the man as the example. So the wife is allowed to uh, masturbate him. So if her hands can do it 
And so it doesn't really it's it's abs it's you know, it's totally absurd to say, well, you know, technically his hands could be on top of her hands. Uh, but the moment she moves her hand, God forbid he was to make contact with his own uh, mm. appendage, uh, this would all of a sudden become haram. I mean, that's like an ad absurdum argument, obviously. Right. But it goes to show that, look, it doesn't. Really, Islam came with a great simp a simplicity, like in a nice way. I love the way Imam Malik's teacher, when asked about this, Abu Zinad, he, he was asked that, you know, can we do certain things? Can we do certain practices? And they were asking about certain kind of sexual practices. And he said, look, if you, he said, if you guys are on your own, husband and wife, he said, if you're on your own behind closed doors, then you're behind closed doors. And he said that uh, then, you know, he said it's what's behind closed doors is behind closed doors. And so the person, it's actually the nephew uh, of, of of Imam Malik's teacher who's, who says to him, he says, oh, OK. And then he doesn't stop. He keeps ch chasing after him. He says like, so he says, OK, so uh, so we can do this. So we can, And then he says to him, do you do it? And, mm. and because he's asking him about uh, in that particular question, he's asking about certain erotic sounds and screams and stuff like this. So he says to him, look, if they're on their own behind closed doors, you know, they're behind closed doors. That's, uh, you know, between them. It's not like this. It's like he's saying to him, it's permissible. So it's behind closed doors. So he's so eventually he asks him that uh, he says, well, to and do you do this? And, and it's a shocking reply he gives, actually. Um, he says, and this is a very respected scholar of, of Medina, you know, from the teachers of Imam Malik. He says, uh, he says, Yabna Akhi, he says, Law ra'ayta amma kwa huwa yujamia. La dhananta no la yu'minu billahi al-azim. He says that, you know, if you saw your uncle uh, in, 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 in these intimate, let's say, sexual moments, you'd think this man doesn't even believe in God. God. <laughs> Which is like, what the hell was he up to? But right. so, you see, I think this obsession with this almost OCD obsession of what people get up to, mm -hmm. um, doesn't it almost breed more, I, ironically, doesn't it breed more promiscuity in a way? I think so. Absolutely right. It does. Yeah, because I think people, if you let people just be... They'll just kind of be, won't they? The moment you start telling them all these, okay, well, here's a list of 112 things you better not do. And here's a list of this many things. And then people think, uh, okay. And it just makes it all, it robs the, the naturalness of the experience. But yeah, I think this is going. This, the, these are going to be great topics you're going to be teaching, <laughs> Dr. Saab. I think people I will think be... <laughs> it's, it's very important. You see, sex education is a subject that has been... Uh, either understressed or it has been neglected totally. Yeah. And it is, uh, I mean, on a very serious note, it needs to be, uh, I mean, people need to be taught about it, the, the do's and the don'ts. And at the same time, the fact that uh, you have to be a person who is purified from inside as much as possible, yeah. uh, uh, in, in, engage in constructive activities and engage in activities which bring, bring you closer to God. But then at the same time, they must also be told that if they indulge in this activity, because I have seen so many young boys or girls, uh, uh, I mean, they do all these things, but they feel extremely guilty and they think that they are yeah. doing the greatest of sins. Because you see, this, there are certain narratives in our Hadith literature which are absolutely inauthentic. And the, the, the punishment that they prescribe for such an act, I mean, if I start uh, I mean, describing them, it's like, uh, I mean, you, you'll, you'll feel as if it's, it's, uh, it's totally something. Which Doesn't this create like a kind of potentially create almost like it push certain people into psychological disorders, like does, psychosis does. almost? Absolutely. You see, when you are doing something which is uh, naturally uh, allowed, maybe in, in a particular uh, way or in a particular uh, context and background, and you're clamping it down, so what you're doing is you are trying to psychologically pressurize that person. You are having him frustrated. And at the same time, as I, I was just speaking, that you make that person feel extremely guilty as if perhaps is doing the greatest of all sins. And there's no greater a sin than uh, indulging in self-gratification. Yeah. And uh, a lot of uh, young boys and girls, when they, they feel that they're doing something wrong, they actually 
start hating their own selves. Yeah. They lose confidence in their own selves. And they are brilliant young boys. And, and they have very low self-esteem, isn't it? They low self-esteem. Yeah, and because they become for a lot embarrassed. Of, uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of brilliant people who might uh, just end up as uh, as people who might go to a maybe an asylum or some place uh, to for rehabilitation as, as uh, for their own me- mental rehabilitation. So I think uh, the reason that I always stress this is that we must be clear that if there is a prohibition, of course, then there is a prohibition. If there is not a prohibition, then why are we fooling or maybe we are uh, doing something to to let our younger generation. Uh, not know something, and of course, this is something which was never prescribed by the Almighty. If something has not been prohibited, in my view, by God or by His Prophet, then who am I? Who am I to prohibit it? I, I mean, what, what is the reason that well, I should? And what what I would also add, Doctor Sub, is that if a person themselves feels, look, this is wrong. I, you know, this is something I will abstain from because I don't. That more power to them. I mean, that's their life. Yeah, this their life. is not, you see, because this, this is, but if somebody else takes mm-hmm. a different opinion, they take the opinion that this is not haram, you know, right. these ulama have said it's not haram, that's their choice. So it's not about, you see, if a person wants to choose something, let's say, more difficult or more of a struggle for themselves, that's right. that's their life, their deen. You know, they want to, if a person says, look, I'm going to walk it every day to a mosque uh, instead yeah. of driving my car because, you know, I right. want to do this. You know, it's their life. The problem is when you impose on other people, also, make them feel guilty. Right. So you see, as a, as a teacher of religion, it is my job to clarify that my understanding of religion is that such and such a thing is allowed or such and yeah. such is not allowed. And my I have a reason to come, come to this conclusion. And my reason is this and this. And if you're not convinced of my reason, OK, carry on with what you are convinced with. But when you say that there is a certain thing which is allowed or not allowed, then you must at least try to understand both the contesting opinions and then whatever you think is uh, appeals to you to your intellect is the one that you should adopt and follow. Yeah. I mean, because that is, you see, it's it's the weird obsession of other people, yeah. you see, which is like, well, it's not about, let's say, me. The, it's like, why are you touching yourself? I mean, that's that's just that question. At what point did the person think that question was OK? Because there's something wrong at every level, because it's, you know, it's the other person has nothing to do with me. It's their life, their devotion to God. And to be fair, the, the sexual instinct, uh, arguably, is perhaps the most powerful instinct, if not amongst the most powerful instincts from a right. psychology perspective, mm-hmm. uh, because it's it's the kind of link to survival and kind of tied into kind of going forth and surviving. But uh, you see, so to just suppress it, because the problem today, look, the problem, and this is something I'd love to get your thoughts on, Dr. Sahab, that look, what is the solution? Because marriages are a nightmare. Let's just be honest. I mean, let's just, you know, the elephant in the room. It's like marriages are a nightmare. I mean, who wants to, not that marriages per se are a nightmare, but the the kind of social construct of a marriage that we have today is for the most part a nightmare because it's like it's so ridiculously expensive. There's so much overburdening commitment from from families, from expectations, from it robs it of any joy that that that, that it's meant to have. And then you, for the most part, if it doesn't work out, you can't leave it because people feel, right. you know, they're trapped. So uh-huh. whereas wasn't, you know, in, in a way, when you look at the sunnah, the, you see, because if we're talking about the urges and the instincts being very natural, and the question is, well, what are people supposed to do, especially with widespread, uh, like you mentioned, sexually kind of excitatory material everywhere? I mean, whether it's on TV, your phones, billboards, wherever, like movies, songs. So people have these kind of and they want they need an outlet. Mm-hmm. And nikah, unfortunately, or zawaj, especially if I can use it in that sense as marriage, as a wedding is so difficult. difficult for it like you couldn't and and it's and on one hand it's almost not even recommended because let's be honest if a, an 18 year old said i'm about to get married you'd think well okay well this is going to be a car crash in slow motion because you know they, they, they haven't got the it's going you know i hope 
the girl doesn't get pregnant that early and I hope does because this is going to just you know you can see where this is going to go uh, because I don't know about in Pakistan but here you know I'm being honest like men on especially muslim men muslim pa- pakistani men but western pakistani men definitely don't probably mature emotionally and in that sense till probably mid 30s i mean they, they you get a lot of this what we call here roadman attitude and you know people this too busy and they always fighting they even if they're 25 they, the men the women maybe they do mature earlier but the men they, 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 there's a lot of problems with the maturity so telling somebody at 18 get married is equally such a so it's like well, where do we go what do we do i mean i know you you must get this question i'd love to get your thoughts on it uh if i may dr sahab yeah right so you see uh what i generally have understood and i talk about with my students and those who ask me is that you see uh sexual desire is something which is as you said perhaps one of the strongest of desires that you uh, that has to be channelized and has to be given its proper outlet uh and before you get the chance that you are actually able to marry someone and you able to do that obviously before that uh, masturbation is one of the options that you have but more than that i think one of the things that you need to understand is that uh, i mean doing parallel constructive activities which involve creativity is something which always uh, a human mind relishes yeah. so i think uh, instead of uh, i mean uh, stopping people or maybe proscribing them for that a better way out for this is that you indulge in other activities which are also equally attractive and i, I think the biggest thing which which is also equally attractive uh, as as sexual activity is or i would say it can match that uh, that activity is that sense of uh, creativity you see when you create something Mm-hmm. an artist could create something a scientist could create something and you create sub- sublimation I mean, they call this as well yeah, in freudian something. psychology to sublimate it's like a sense yeah it's yeah. like a sense of fulfillment mm-hmm. so if our youths are given this this uh, alternative that they indulge more in these activities which in which you make things from your hands in which you do service to the society in which you are involved in a lot of things that engage you in a positive way then of course sexualism or sexuality is something that's going to still attract you but then it's going to fall in its place it's not going to consume like 24 hours or 14 hours the way it does uh, in let's in say the- let's say you've got um uh, uh, let's say late college um i don't know like an 18 year old 19 year old let's say um they're going to college or uni or whatever it is uh, and now they you know there's a little relationship kind of chemistry going on uh but they they just want to do just amongst themselves make it halal and just see how it goes because they want to they don't know and but if it, if it becomes a big thing then you know one let's say the families won't be willing for them to be getting married anyway at this stage but they just want to kind of they, they want it halal but they want to just 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 go with the flow they want to say look let's go with this if it, let's go with it as long as you know if we feel it's not working we'll part ways gracefully you know with uh, you know we will be respectful but um how would you re- respond or what what are your thoughts on something I like think, that uh, if you if you're referring to the fact that uh, they they indulge in uh, in a sexual activity then oh, no, they could do it i mean like they could do a nikah just between them oh, the and nikah. they could do I a think- nikah but it's not a a right. wedding it's not, it's not a wedding in the uh, in the I, social I, sense I, of a wedding it's just like let's say they do a nikah uh they let's say they say okay you know we we you know fine let's say people know they're in a relationship uh let's say all their friends and all these people know but it's not known known like their mom and dad don't know uh but so i mean because you must be getting questions this look because this is happening let's let's you know the, the elephant in the room this is happening let's not pretend this isn't happening so what are you i don't know what what your thoughts would uh, if you have thoughts on that i'd love to hear some some thoughts because this I, is I, you know i understand you see uh, the important thing that we need to understand here is that the word nikah the word nikah actually means a public declaration of being husband and wife Yeah. So if you are not declaring yourself to be publicly husband and wife it's not a nikah at all and it's i mean it's like a covert relationship and as far as my understanding goes it's not allowed at all by by religion because you see what happens is that 
uh, when you live in a sexual relationship, the Almighty wants us to announce to the society that, well, yes, this is a husband and this is a wife, mm -hmm. because there are certain rights which are and certain obligations which as a result accrue. And if the, if the wife gets pre pregnant, for example, you just cannot walk away from her by, by saying that, well, because our, our tempers do not match or our temperament does not match, you can just have the baby aborted or maybe you can just raise it as a single parent. Uh, and, and that's the end of that. So you see, to safeguard these things, hmm. Islam wants the union to be a declared union. And another thing is that when you walk away, you don't know that you are actually, I mean, something could, could always ignite or uh, bring to surface what, what you're hiding. Maybe a past relationship could always be exposed out of enmity, out of some grudge that you might later on develop with your former partner. And then instead of hiding that, you actually bring it to light and start but to... Just playing along with this uh, hypothesis and devil's advocate, I guess, Dr. Zahab, people could say, well, look, this isn't a secret secret. It's not like covert, like shh, like people know. Like, let's say people on the campus know, people at the university people know. Uh, it's not that this is a, a hidden, hidden secret. It's not like a dirty secret, but it's not a wedding, wedding, wedding. And yes, the families don't know. And also for things like birth control. I mean, there's things like birth control and there's things like... Uh, right. and so I'm just saying, putting that in from that argument, from playing the antagonistic argument here how would you what would your thoughts I, be on I, that? I think I would still not go along with it because you see uh, you see what happens is that you the, the premise that uh, on the basis of which you are getting married is that whether you're compatible or not to each other I mean mm -hmm. the way that you are uh, conducting yourself is that let's okay get together see whether we are compatible or not and uh, and a lack of compatibility would would, would result in an annulment of this uh, of this relationship. Now, if you look up uh, marriage and uh, history of marriage, you realize that this lack of compatibility or, or, or not lack of compatibility is something which can always change in the later part of your life. You see, initially you could be uh, very incompatible and it's just like, like going along in time when you have children, the compatibility factor at times arises because of the adjustment. You see, in, in, initially when you are given this choice that you can always part ways whenever you like, the the amount of adjustment which a person should show to accommodate the spouse it automatically uh, comes down to a very low level because you already already have the option well okay i'll just walk, i can just walk away from this relationship so i think uh, you need to understand that whatever the relationship between a man and a wife these are they are always going to be two different people yeah. however much they come together they have the same views regarding religion or culture or society the habits cannot always be the same and these habits always account for a different personality mm -hmm. and so the key word in marriage is to adjust and accommodate and to understand that well if you are uh, i mean uh, if you are adjusting for the other person the other person is adjusting for you so marriage is basically uh, i mean if i if someone very beautifully de de uh, defined marriage once and i always uh, do cling to this definition uh, he said that well Marriage is the union. I mean, in fact, his words were perfect marriage. Perfect marriage is the union of two imperfect people who come together and hide one another's imperfections. Wow. So That's perfect marriage. Is, you know, that they, yeah, you are a like, garment for one another. You have to realize that oh. everyone is not perfect. If you're not satisfied with one spouse, you will never be satisfied generally because you see what you're doing is you're trying to become an ideal. You, you're trying to find someone who is an ideal person. And this world is not a place for idealism. But, so would, you, but would you not, with the argument, Dr. Saab, that most people, their first one, two relationships often are going to be disasters and they're only going to learn from experience. And it's as they mature they become more capable of mature relationships. Like if I, let's say we take ourselves, like let's say each person, I don't know how old all the viewers will be, but let's say I was to do this hypothetically with me, I was to take myself and detract like 20 years, like I go back in time and I meet the, let's say I'm 43 now, the 23 year old me. Um, I, I don't think I could stand that me. 
uh, now the the me now could not stand the the me well, then, and right. and and this is all part of growth in life. You know, we're growing, we're developing, we're kind of changing. Even if you go back ten years, you you would be very different. And people are growing at different rates. And one of the things about I guess this is this is another very difficult question than with relationships because. Nobody teaches us how to handle relationships. Like we don't, you don't get taught it in school. You don't、mm. get taught it from books. You、mm. just watch it on TV, which is not a true representation. You watch your parents, who in most cases, unfortunately, are going to be a very poor, bad example of of that. So not not to blame them. May Allah bless everybody's parents. I mean, but I'm just being realistic. So now. And you're quite young. You're quite inexperienced. You're the very person that you yourself in twenty years' time will won't be able to stand you. So,、mm. you know, you are you're making ridiculous. You're annoying. You're kind of doing dumb stuff. You're immature. You're not emotionally intelligent. And you know, it's it's like a like bumper cars. And so. It's probably you know, especially in this part of the world. I think this is why relationships probably break down.、Uh, maybe I'm not saying it's the only reason, but then when people reach a certain mature age, then they're like, "Oh right, okay, now I know how to do it properly because I've done a few." <laughs> they're like, "Now don't be a bloody idiot and don't do this. I should be, you know, I should be more understanding of. I should be more mature. I should be more caring." You know how you said that was so beautiful. Like you said, look. Two imperfect people covering each other's、uh, imperfections、uh, perfectly, and this this whole you know libasul lakum concept of the garment of the Quran is beautiful. But let's be honest. I mean, you get let's say twenty year old or an eighteen year old, and it's it's not really it's it's a very different realm. It's just pure lust driven. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with lust driven, but I'm just saying it's a different paradigm. Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. I'm not saying anybody has the answers, but I wonder what you, <laughs> if you have any thoughts.、Uh, my thoughts are that you see,、uh, just, just as parenting is an art, being a spouse or being engaged as a spouse to the other spouse is also an art.、Yeah. So you just said that teaching,、uh, we are not taught about、uh, how to behave as a spouse.、Uh, neither are we taught in the schools or colleges or universities. Uh, the best example that we have are the t- these TV dramas or these movies in in which they I mean have an entirely different background、yeah. and your own parents are not the best、uh, examples as well.、Mm-hmm. So I think the most important thing is that this art of being a spouse or the art of marriage, so to speak, how to be a person who is、uh, who's going to understand and、uh, instead of being an idealist, he is more of a practical.、Uh, he is a more、uh, Pragmatic in his approach, and realize that this is not a perfect place. Earth is not a place that you're going to、yeah. find everything in everyone. So it's ma- it's a matter of adjustment. It's a matter of、uh, accommodating the other person. It's a matter of highlighting the some of the good things that the other person has. It's a matter of contributing to the growth of your spouse.、Yeah. So I think the, the the thing that we are lacking severely is this education. Just as we are lacking in sexual education, we are also lacking in 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 counseling in marriage. And as a marriage counselor myself, I see when people come to me and spouses come to me, it's already too late. When things have crossed their limits,、uh, and then it's the time for、mm-hmm. counselling. And then people come and say, "Well, I did this and that." Whereas actually, the right time for this is even before marriage. So before we get married, I think if we realise people can come together and offer this coaching, and I think this is part of life coaching, which today many people are offering,、yeah. that as life coaches. They instruct young boys and girls in the art of marriage. What exactly marriage means? What exactly should they be looking for? And the top thing is here,、uh, that they need to understand is that they are going to bring a new life into existence. And if until they are harmonious to each other, until they are respectful to each other, they will be a complete disaster. For the next generation, because they're going to watch you and see how you fight with each other, how you pick your、uh, faults, and、uh, and it goes on and on. So I think it's like, like it's like a thing that needs to be taught as a subject, maybe at the university,、mm-hmm. uni level,、uh, parenting, spouse,、uh, spousal treatment, and、uh, and the art of marriage, in which you are actually made to go through these、uh, some of these exercises, in which you're made to understand that look, these are the, some of the common mistakes which spouses do. These are the common mistakes which parents do. Absolutely, yeah. I, th- I, th- I think that's so beautifully said about the art 
of marriage or the art of relationships. And because, and I think one thing as well that we, we could add there, Dr. Saab, is that having role models, because the, cause the TV is, you know, it's so artificial. The, the, the lifestyle, it's a movie. I mean, it's, it's made right. for, you know, entertainment. It's not made for, um, and they know exactly what to say. They know mm-hmm. the right lines, the right dialogues, the right kind of quotes. Everyday person, you know, they'd be, they wouldn't know what to, what to say in that situation. And so the people, when they look around, how do you have, how, how am I supposed to behave in a relationship? They look to people that they may know in their in their world, and they, it may be their uncle or their parents or their neighbors or their you know just people they know. And I think good, if I can say good or, or good enough role models would you know maybe it would add to that. But then one of the problems with this, Doctor Zab, is that you see in this world of Instagram, there's so much artificiality that it's raised the benchmark it's because. Raised the because now when you look online, everybody's bloody, you know, they're on holiday with Bay and they're having coffee with Bay and they're, oh, mm-hmm. they're doing all these nice romantic things. And uh, and not that there's anything wrong with nice romantic things, but they, it's fake because even the people in the Instagram are not that happy. They're just trying to show the world that we're so happy. Right. But mm-hmm. when you watch 10 people looking extremely happy and mm-hmm. then you think, bloody hell, I'm a miserable git. My life mm-hmm. isn't this happy. So mm-hmm. th- this makes things so much worse because it's an uphill you know you mm-hmm. feel like i can never be as good i can never be as happy as that person in that instagram picture and so yeah i mean yeah, what, so, what? See, these are some of the challenges that all of us face and every age has its own challenge and just as uh, social media has so many uh, advantages and benefits so this is the downside uh, in which, of course, people get frustrated. Uh, they, they they think that well, unless you have a very beautiful wife uh, or be- or a very handsome husband, marriage cannot even proceed. You just cannot even think of uh, going ahead. So, as you said, these are artificial standards in which uh, the apparent has become the decisive factor. Mm-hmm. The fact that the person is a good person from inside, he has a or she has a wonderful character. She is a very ca- caring human being. All these standards have been relegated. Because all the stress is on the outward appearance and how a person looks like. And this has, as you said, raised the bar and given such uh, artificial uh, uh, parameters to the, uh, to the institution of marriage. False expectations. And result, yeah, it's false expectations. And as a result, you see, there are so many people who are average looking. I mean, yeah. the, the Almighty doesn't, is not, I mean, he doesn't produce, so to speak, uh, beautiful people uh, all the while. I mean, there, there may be 60% who are ordinary looking or average looking. So for them, life becomes even more difficult because yeah. then they are in a rat race or they would like to enter that rat race without having the equipment. And then they indulge in all sorts of other things to, to satisfy themselves. And this takes its toll. And then uh, you can see how the fabric of the society, it, it totally dwindles and uh, it gets uh, it lost in this, uh, in this whole race. Wow. I mean, it's so, it's one of those things that I guess it's like a, a sinking ship and we've, you know, people were just, we're kind of just removing yeah. a bucket of water at a time. Uh-huh. And it's, yeah, it's somewhat it's analogous. Temporary, temporary relief. You're not talking about the long-term relief. You're talking about a temporary <laughs> relief. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and it's true. And there's just so many, it's it's one of those things. I, I think I really, I'm so glad that you are doing a course on this that you are tackling uh, you know you're firefighting these issues you're kind of at the front line trying to teach people because there's so many questions so many things people throw up and and it doesn't mean that there are you know it's it's real life it's dynamic it's not about a textbook answer it's there's there's uh, there's movement you know there's um this beautiful clip I was watching where somebody was explaining the laws of physics and he said, well, you know, he takes a, a ball and he says, well, you know, if somebody came and kicked this ball and um, and he said that we could actually, you know, if we knew, OK, the, he kicked it from this angle, we knew the angle, we knew the pressure that went into the ball, where it hits the ball, the kind of air resistance, the directionality, we could have very good prediction on exactly where it would land, given right. the laws of mathematics and physics. And he said, mm-hmm. but then let's say the very same movement with that calculation, but he kicks a cat. I mean, I'm not saying to kick a cat or any living animal or a squirrel or anything. It, 
the, all the all the mathematics have gone out the window because it's a dynamic creature. Mm. Anything mm. with life, it completely changes. It's not computational in the same way. So these are real life, very difficult kind of well, things. And then there's all sorts. And obviously, you know, coming from in Pakistan, there's so many issues. We still have them here. And, you know, in the UK, we still have people that will be, uh, for example, marriages. They won't allow them based on what qom and zat and things like this, and they will say, you know, such and such are from this side, and such and such are a low caste, and such and such are this. We still have that that here in the UK. I mean, cause coming from the Pakistani thing right here, we've brought it along. Mm -hmm. I think right. now people are slightly moving out of it. We've had, you know, in the UK, there was a study done. Um, it was released, uh, I believe, was it late last year, early this year? But it was a study done on... Um, on disabilities in this is in the UK that children born with disabilities or learning difficulties and they showed that in that study that uh, Pakistani specifically I mean you've got all kinds of Pakistanis are a large ethnic minority here but you've got others as well you've got Bangladeshis you've got Indians you've got many other people as well Arab communities and but still they showed that Pakistanis contributed to i think was it something like uh three percent or something or it was a small percentage of births each year so like mm -hmm. if you count the ethnicity that let's say british pakistani there were a small percent i can't remember whether it's four percent or five percent or whatever it was but it's a small percentage but they contributed over 50 percent or up to i think it was 50 or 50 something percent of mm -hmm. children with disabilities Right. Or, or learning difficulties. And this was because of the kind of uh, the in marriages, the in further in and in and in and yeah. in into cousins. And, and it's not just one cousin. It's not just mm. like, oh, this mm. person married. It's like they were cousins what and they were cousins right. and they were cousins. And uh, and it was it was really shocking. They, they it was it was then people. It was on a little, uh, I think, uh, a BBC program as well or something. Just a small, uh, I think, like a two, half an hour discussion on it. But yeah, so this was so. These are some of the problems people are still grappling. Now people are trying to move away with with them. I wonder how the scene is or the landscape is in Pakistan with all of this. I think it's very similar. Uh, but you see, uh, one thing that you might need to, uh, I would humbly request to revise, is that Pakistan is is, is part of the same global uh, uh, background that you have just referred to. It's not that it's, uh, it's isolated from the rest of the world. Of course. I mean, course, yeah. it's, it's like uh, exactly the same things go on. The only thing is that at times they go on uh, in a secret way or maybe they're not very prominent. But every single thing that you find in other parts of the world, you'll find a reflection of that occurring in Pakistan, in our educational institutions, in our uh, in our villages even. Uh, though, the, as I said, it would be in a different st style or they might hide it. But the fact is that it's no longer a country which is isolated in its yeah. practices, which you could say, well, uh, it's different from the rest of the countries. And this is because of the globalization of course, of that social media has brought. And yeah. precisely for this reason, I am a, a very big advocate of the fact that we must open up discussions on every single topic that comes to mind. Uh, the young mind, especially if they have a problem with religion, if they have a problem uh, in any sort of uh, sphere which relates to religion in any way, uh, they should be encouraged uh, to ask those questions. And also the answer given to them should be that, well, this is one, one of my answers or how I have thought about this uh, question. And I, I, I may be wrong and I may be right. But what I would encourage you is to continue with your quest. You must find out and keep on finding this out and never think that you've found the ultimate truth. This is an ongoing process and it will continue till your last breath. So the quest for the truth, to, to quest to critically analyze views and to be humble in your views that you can always be wrong. This is the way forward, I think. And keeping uh, down or discussing or not uh, making other people discuss things which you think were in discuss. Uh, let's say two or three decades ago, that's not going to solve the problem. It's yeah. going to worsen it. Okay, no, and I just want to say just very quickly, absolutely, and shukran, and I don't, you know, for any of the viewers, I don't don't mean it in any of that way. And to be fair, that 
Um, I, I mean, I didn't mean it in a, in a kind of disparaging way. And to be fair, there are now with the younger kind of uh, more generation and also the awareness that's been created, people have moved away a lot from this kind of stuff. Uh, right. We see now all the, the what I see myself as well, and many people, the younger kind of weddings and marriages and relationships all going on, people are all diversifying and they're all kind of, um, you know, disregarding these some of these ridiculous kind of customs of caste and all of this kind of stuff. So alhamdulillah, I mean, it is very uh, promising and uh, yes, of course. And and uh, coming to this point, I really I'm glad that you um, do that, Dr. Saab, because it's I think it's one of the most you see, it's it's one of the most difficult things for a person who really values faith to say is that, look, I've got a problem with something about the faith. And I think one of the biggest problems is one of the one of another great challenge in that is they themselves are helpless in it. So they can't. It's like, imagine there's a medical issue. Uh, okay, but even what if I need help with something, I'm not a doctor. Now, I could try Googling, but that would be a disaster. I mean, try Googling a medical condition and, you know, mm. probably tell you you're already dead <laughs> six <laughs> weeks ago. But so right. the uh, so similarly, you if somebody who's an expert or somebody who's trained can give you advice. Now, a person tr is trained troubled with let's say their faith for whatever reason they obviously don't have the answers to it if they did they wouldn't be troubled but they and they don't know they're not trained nowhere near to get those answers and so for them to muster the courage to turn up to someone and say well look i've got this problem but then mm -hmm. it could sound disturbing like maybe they say look i don't i don't know you know i'm mm -hmm. i'm disturbed by some of the things that right. i'm hearing about Islam or I'm disturbed with this particular issue or I've got a problem with that or how do you reconcile this or and then the last thing that ever should happen here is that they be shut down and say mm -hmm. you know how dare you question oh, this you know because right. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's what are they supposed to do I mean that's I feel that's such a disservice to Allah and his messenger and this deen you know, to because it's an amana ultimately to be able to, if somebody comes to you and fair enough, if you don't know the answer, you don't know the answer. You say, look, you know, I'll, I don't know that maybe like it's like this, but we can look into it. I can, you know, let me speak to some people. Or, but yeah, it's because um, this it's amazing when we look at the early Salaf of Islam, uh, we find that almost for the first one to two hundred years, a lot of the ulama were very, the salaf were all about la adri, I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, if you read Imam Malik's fatawa in his mudawwana or even in his motta sometimes when he speaks, he'll he'll say things like, look, um, I prefer, I, I feel, yeah. I, I love this, I like this. Uh, mm -hmm. He'll say things like akra. La I it, I don't like it. You know, it's that you do some. Very mm. rarely would you hear Imam Malik or Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam the early Imam saying things like this is haram. This is you shutting people down. Very. It's, I mean, it's not that they. I'm sure there were obviously certain things, but it, they most of their things is this kind of, you know, a uh, bit of a. I don't know. I don't like it. I'm not sure. I don't feel this is right. I don't. Yeah, and so they're very humble. Yeah. They're ex ex extremely humble in their approach, and they let other people give. They give that breathing space to the other person. They well, yes, if this is my personal preference, you can differ with it, and this is how I feel. And this that is why they were able to create a generation who was very confident, who could contribute a lot. But you see, as the fic uh, centric approach, uh, it got dominant or it dominated. Uh, that self-belief and the fact that you would uh, you're a person who is going to be answerable to God yourself, and so therefore you be careful yourself. That actually uh, slowly uh, disintegrated, and uh, it became it was replaced by the fatwa of the imam, in which you could actually decide for you something that you should have decided for your own self, keeping in view certain principles. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is very important that we open up discussions, and as you rightly said that people might not be comfortable in raising questions themselves. So the alternative to this that I find is that you go to, to youngsters, you go to people, you talk about these, uh, these issues, you open up these issues, 
And once you do that, you'll give the other person or the people the confidence that, yes, they can also take part in this conversation. And slowly and gradually, they can be uh, made part of it. So uh, giving them this, this boost uh, is by reaching out to them yourselves and going up to them and telling them that these are some taboo subjects that uh, were not discussed in yesteryears. But yes, today we need to discuss them so that we can contribute much more to a society which is already uh, dismember, I mean, just dismembering in, in various ways. Yeah, I mean, and uh, uh, just a last thing on this to to sum that up, you know, what, when you mentioned the whole kind of gradation or the development of, let's say, Islamic history coming along and the fiqh thing, I, I would kind of put the term there that there was a dogmatism developed. And I wanted to pick your thoughts just very quickly, and then we will uh, bring this to an, an end. I know that we've taken so much of your time, Dr. Sal. What do you think, because this is a very relevant thing, what... what what do you think are the causes of what causes dogmatism? Like because I and, and I get that's a very profound. Uh, I you know I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Doctor Sal, but just if they've got some thoughts on dogmatism because think, it's yes, uh, yeah, I think that fundamentally uh, one verse of the or I would say one misinterpretation of a Quranic verse has played its role uh, okay. in which uh, and you see the word uh, used in very initially in Surah Baqarah are you minuna bil ghayb. And they have generally been interpreted as that you they just accept something which is blindly, I mean, they just don't mm -hmm. question something. And Iman bil ghaib is, uh, is something like, like they, whatever they've been told, they just go and accept it without questioning it. I think this is uh, an approach which has, um, on which we have been modeled. And instead of linking ourselves intellectually to the Quran and trying to understand exactly what a particular directive would mean, uh, this dogmatic approach means that you don't question, you're just given a dogma and you, whether you accept it or not, I mean, it could be uh, very fateful for you, but you just cannot question it. You just cannot ask the reason for it. And one of the things that has uh, has gone very far is this Yominuna Bil Ghaib verse, which okay. you'll find penetrating in a lot of Muslim minds, which which tell, which are, I mean, they, they think that, well, if you've been told something that you must not question it, it's like Iman bil Ghaib, and for uh -huh. them, Ghaib is everything which is told by God without any question. Wow, I never and, thought of that, actually, that verse in that sense that you're saying, Yu'minuna bil Ghaib, that this was kind of to shut down uh, reason, to say, well, you know, Yu'minuna right. bil Ghaib, yeah. just shut it down. It's just uh, shut down your reason and just accept what mm. you're being told. And although this this verse not even means what has been derived from it, I mean it has an entirely different meaning. But unfortunately, a uh, very common interpretation of this word of this verse, I would say, which is an erroneous interpretation, is that you just blindly follow uh, and accept whatever you have been told. And look at what the Quran says. It yeah. says that you have to use your intellect. And regarding uh, the people who would end up in hell, it says laukunna nasmaru au nafilu makun nafi sabi sorry. We had had we used our intellect and we had listened. You would not have been uh, the companions of hell. Yeah. So I think this is, this is like uh, uh, recharging our youth and telling them that you can question everything. You have the power. And the, and the way to get empowered in this, in this area is that you find out the reason behind the prohibition or allowance of a particular directive. Just don't take it on face value because your father or your mother or your teacher is telling them. Ask why. Ask her why. And get satisfied with the reason. Otherwise, look for more people who could dissatisfy would you. Would you say that with anything or only things that bother you? I think uh, you start off with things that bother you. That's the mm -hmm. that's the natural, yeah. uh, I mean, the person why is about things that bother you. And slowly, you extend that other thing as well. Why? Because you see, as a parent, one day you will be have to, you'll have to communicate these things to your children as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're educated and if you know the reason, then it would be much more easier for you to communicate certain things. So yes, the quest would start off with things that bother you, but I think it should slowly engulf and envelop those things as well, which might not uh, bother you, but you'd like to find out that why is it that I am uh, uh, being asked to do something or asked not to do something. Mm, wow. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Very shukran, shukran. Those, those are very profound words. And absolutely, I mean, I... Uh, the, people as well for the viewers i mean if you didn't catch that that dr zaba just highlighted especially these people miss relaying or miss kind of not really misappropriating these verses things like yu'minuna bil ghayb people who believe in an unseen or in the unseen that this in a way is to say well 
you know, it doesn't matter that you can't see it. Therefore, you don't even need to understand it. The verse doesn't say people who can't understand it, but things that they don't see. Because if you think of it, even tomorrow is from the unseen. You see, right. and we believe in tomorrow, like we believe in a better future. We believe in hope. We believe in faith. All of these things technically are from the ghaib and, and a life after death, that there will be life. This is only, you know, it's from the, the un imperceptible in front of us. Dr. Saab, shukran, it's been an absolute pleasure, honestly. It's been an honor. Uh, it's been an honor um, just just sharing this this space with you, time space, and just getting your thoughts. Uh, for, about your course, If uh, can people attend it? Is it too late? What, what's the... Well, yes, uh, but, uh, I mean, we are, we are conducting these courses at two levels. Uh, I mean, the first of them is in a, in an in-person environment. It's like a physical presence that, that, okay. that requires... This, and the course is where? It. It's in Toronto, it's Canada. Toronto. It's in Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a particular space that has been sure. offered. I think the seats have already probably uh, gotten filled up. But, but and the website that, is the, is yes, it the I Maurit? Think, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not yet being displayed on the. Uh, yes, Al Maurit Institute Canada would be displaying something like that. Okay. So, the Instagram page I know is active. I think yes, Al Maurit. There is an Instagram page. There are some other Facebook pages regarding Al Maurit Institute Canada in which you'll find more details. But later on, I do plan to conduct them online or to visit other parts of the world where people might be interested uh, to get themselves educated on these issues. So it's like a it's like a journey that we are about to start, inshallah. Yeah, I, th I think it's wonderful people, especially those of you in Canada, around uh, the Toronto area or just in Canada, if you've got time, it's going to be, it's going to last a week, is it? Or a couple it's of days? Like, no, it's, it's basically two sessions this Sunday uh, from three to six. And then next Sunday from three to six, it's like a six hour session. I mean, six hour total uh, period uh, with three hours on one Sunday and three hours on the next Sunday. Excellent. And I can just see Sean Sheikh in the comments saying, look, the seats, there's still seats left. So do join. Um, those of you that are in touch with Sean Sheikh, you can just reach out to him as well or go to the Instagram page. If you're there, definitely, it'll be a great opportunity just to meet Dr. Saab in person, in the flesh, would be an honor in and of itself. So get yourself there, people. I will share some links to the the pages on, on, the, on this YouTube de, um, description as well. Um, Dr. Saab, if people want to reach out to you, is there a platform that you, that you have? I think uh, you can give them my... My email address or my cell phone number. Oh, uh, whoa, I don't think you know, Doctor. I don't think you want to give also, people. I think, uh, I think two years ago when we were together, you said that don't do that. But you see, this is what I do. I mean, I, I'd like to be in the thick of things, and uh, why? Why should I run away? I mean, when I'm in this, uh, in this. Ser uh, if you seriously, if you okay, if you you tell me after I've done, if you tell me, I will put it up there. You, <laughs> you can just give my number. I mean, whoever asks, he's most welcome to get okay. in touch with wow. you. On, on, so on there what you go. Time. That is very, very hospitable people, I must say. And Doctor Saab does share some beautiful reminders. Uh, so that's that's definitely something that really adds to your week, people. Shukran for your time. First of all, Dr. Saab, shukran. It's been an absolute... We've gone through so many topics. I mean, we've jumped right from... Uh, the th right from theology to contr to controversial things, matters of blasphemy, to the age of Aisha. We've discussed that. I mean, we've come right through to very difficult grounds like relationships and how to kind of navigate through them, intimacy issues, compatibility issues, uh, prohibitions, taboos. Uh, and then, you know, this this thing of, look, being confident to ask about your faith and not be embarrassed. I think it's it's been a wonderful journey you've taken us on. So shukran once again. People, if you don't, you know, if a person doesn't, if you don't thank people, you haven't truly thanked God. So uh, shukran once again. And people, likewise, I know it's been quite an evening, you guys as well, for hanging in there and enjoying. Do If you want to reach out, you're more than welcome. I'll share the links for Dr. Saab. For me, you're more than welcome. Usually Instagram's a better place. Uh, or you can search Patreon as well. Other than that, take very good care of yourselves, people. And all of you from me, salam alai alaikum wa khuda hafiz. And likewise, Dr. Saab. I'll be putting up the end slide uh, for the contact page.